ancestral village of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. We are thankful to conduct our work within their territory. I'd like to call to order the regular council meeting of May 11th, 2020. Now, uh, I've already gone through the raising the hands piece. So let's start off with approval of the agenda, please. Can I get someone to move the agenda? Moved. Uh, Rob moved. Sorry, who second. second? Carolina, second? Yes. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed, motion carried. Next is adoption of the minutes. Can I get someone to move it? So, so moved. moved. Carolina moved. Bruce was seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion carried. We have no delegations. Our first report is Ken. And Ken, if you can outline 5.1, please. I'll just wait for it to show up on the screen, maybe here. Yeah. So uh, this report uh, is an update on uh, what actions are being taken or and are being proposed or will be undertaken to maximize the return on uh, investment of the village's surplus and reserve funds. So first of all, you can see uh, that under the community charter, there is a limit on what um, local government funds can be invested in. And uh, of course, one of them is pooled investment funds under the MFA Act. Um, they are more secure investments. Um, and when we look at the history of the village's uh, investments of its surplus and reserve funds, can you page down a little bit, Paula, please? Oh, a little bit up now, yeah. We can see that um, for the most part, uh, the longer term funds have been invested in the Municipal bond Finance Authority Bond Fund. And the, the Municipal Finance Authority has three funds, the Money Market Fund, their Intermediate Fund, and the Bond Fund, which are have different investment time horizons. And we can see, if we go on to the second page, that, uh, as I said, the village has traditionally invested his long-term funds in the, the uh, MFA bond fund. And you can see the history of what the fund has, has earned there. Uh, and also the village uh, has, of course, kept a fair amount of cash inside of its bank account. And uh, on its bank balance, it's being paid uh, prime less 2%, which was of course, much better in January of this year than it is right now, where it's earning minimal interest. So the, the keys to maximizing return on investments are uh, fourfold. Uh, the first one is having uh, a solid cash flow system in place, which will tell you uh, how much money you've got to invest for how long or for what periods of time. And so the second key to re maximizing return on, on your investments is uh, a solid long-term financial plan. And uh, of course the village is working on that in the future so that there will be more predictability in terms of when monies are needed for uh, larger projects in particular. As you, as you know, um, if all of a sudden a financial plan changes and you bring forward a large project, it affects cash flow. Uh, and cash flow uh, projections are based on what your financial plan is saying as to when you would need money, in what year, in what month. So uh, when that plan changes, it can uh, upset uh, what you're trying to do with your investments, but uh, at the same time, the plan, the, uh, the plan and, the, and the cash flow projections have to be flexible enough to uh, take into account things that may happen because everything is not exactly always predictable. So the, the other crucial step to maximizing return on investments is quotations. And now that we have a cash flow system in place that tells us 
how much funds we have to invest for what periods of time. Um, we are in a position, once we kind of gauge the first collections coming from taxes in July of going out into the market to get quotations for various investment products at various institutions. So that would be a step uh, that will be undertaken after we have a more determinant of what, how the COVID situation has affected our cash uh, from taxes, which will be coming in uh, in June and July, hopefully the majority of it. Um, the other uh, factor in maximizing returns is trying to get the best deal you can at the bank on uh, funds that are there for short-term cash needs and there will always be some funds needed in the bank. So the next uh, step that you're undertaken is to look at some other banking arrangements with, with some other local governments have with banks to see whether we can approve uh, the interest rate we're earning on cash deposits at the bank. So those steps are uh, considered important for maximizing our return on the village's investments in our surplus and, and reserve funds. So uh, there's two uh, recommendations for council's consideration. And of course, as always, if council has any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Thanks, Ken. Can I get someone to move the item? So moved. Bruce? Yes, I'll move it. Second. Um, Carolina, Carolina second. Carolina seconding, thank you. And uh, as we enter into discussion, uh, the background I asked Ken, and I talked about this for more than a year, uh, to, to, to try to give us a better idea of what our options are, because when we were first elected, I remember hearing from the financial contractor at the time that we had our portfolio declined by approximately 22,000. And I talked to the mayor of Anmore and while they had three times as much money invested, he said theirs had gone up by 100,000 in value. So I thought it would be worth taking a look to see at least if we had a good sound strategy. And that's where this, uh, this that's the, the genesis mm -hmm. of this project. And now we've got Ken on board to help us work through this. So uh, Bruce, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ken, obviously uh, we're in uh, unusual territory as we virtually always are. Uh, what, how, how do these uh, various opportunities appear now? Can you offer any opinion on those? Um, just raising my hand. <laughs> well, go ahead. Ken, please, just uh, you can, whether you want to be formal and say through the chair, go ahead when it's a question asked directly to you, please. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, in terms of opportunities, you know, if we look at the cash flow, uh, which we've done up, you know, it, it indicates we have about a million dollars of longer term funds, mm -hmm. uh, which is consistent with what the, the village has currently invested in the MFA bond fund, which is around a million dollars. And the cash flow indicates that, you know, we'll, we'll be bringing in between two and, and 2.5 million dollars um, in around June or July, depending on how clocks collections go. And that monies can be invested at staggered amounts yeah. uh, over the next year. When I say staggered amounts, that's because we can invest money up to the point where we have to pay other agencies. For example, the school taxes is a major part of that. And the school taxes are not due until the end of the year this year. So we'll have an opportunity to earn interest on those school tax funds that we collect in advance of that. Uh, so in that regard, there's some opportunities in terms of some delayed payments that will be due, but um, I think that um, we're going to have to make, of course, the other payments to the other agencies. But you know, we also you know have to have bring up enough money on a monthly basis to pay for operations. Yeah, and so um, that can range between eighty to um, one hundred thirty thousand a month. I understand. So I know. I guess. Ken, my question really has more to do with, in my, and 
I appreciate uh, you're much more sophisticated in this than I am. Um, I would read the MFA bond fund as low risk, low return, and uh, and and that it's it's if you have absolutely no appetite for risk, you're likely to go there. Uh, whereas the others are probably a little more volatile, but have the potential for a higher return. Is that a fair summary? I wouldn't say that's necessarily true because. The other investment products you see, like they're guaranteed by a charter bank, et cetera. Yeah. They're very, you know, that's like term deposits, GICs, things like that. Right? We, we literally very can't safe. put anything in where the principal's at risk, Bruce. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're, we're, limited, we're limited to low risk opportunities, I guess is the point. Right? Yeah. The trip you were thinking go to Vegas and put everything on red, unfortunately, is not an option. Uh, but I've, I've already done it. Done it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> But having said, just another point, just on the MFA bond fund, for example, you know, the, the MFA funds can carry uh, corporate paper that we can't carry in uh, individually. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? So I couldn't go out and buy a corporate bond by itself. The only way I can do that is through an MFA investment fund. So they are an avenue of actually getting more diversified and yeah. investing in companies that I couldn't normally invest in. As a municipality, so. That's right. Where it's a question of how competent and how, uh, well, competent or lucky the uh, parties making the decisions are in these various funds. That's fine, thank you, Ken. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands. So anyone from the gallery have any comments or questions? All right, nothing there. So if I can ask you, everybody, so you've noticed the recommendation, there's two pieces and the, uh, the second part, of course, financial consultant can report to council on quotations received for investment vehicles would be the outcome of us approving this report and his ability to go out and seek some, uh, some information to share with us for decisions later. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed, motion carried. We are, Early on 7.30, Lorna, shall we jump ahead? Would you recommend? Yes, Your Worship, I noticed that uh, the Chief was on a while ago. Maybe he isn't anymore. Uh, let me look. He's under Sassamas. So I think we could go forward um, All right. item on the agenda, Your Worship. All right, so let's go to set. Let's go to 5.3. So welcome Chief Sharp to the meeting and uh, look forward to providing a verbal report regarding the summary of the two fires at Turtlehead Road and Sinclair Road, please. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. I, I just wanted to make a few comments about uh, the two large fire events in Belcaro over the last couple of years. There's been a, a lot of talk from a lot of people about those events and um, uh, some of the information that people were calling from the minutes of a meeting that was held April 19th, 2019. Um, in that meeting, uh, I appeared before the Water Committee and was asked a series of questions and, uh, uh, you know, gave a bunch of information. Um, the one item that I guess uh, is the most troubling for me is a comment that I had made um, that suggested that the outcome of the Turtle Head Fire and the Sinclair Road Fire would not have changed had we had additional water resources. Um, that is true, I made that comment, but what was uh, omitted from the minutes was the preamble up to that point. Um, so uh, on the Turtle Head fire, uh, by the time the fire department got the call, arrived on scene and set up, the first house was already fully involved and the second house uh, was already involved and the fire had spread. So we had one major fully involved structure and another house that obviously uh, became fully involved too. No fire department, uh, not all the water in the world would have changed the outcome of that, that event. Um, that, both of those houses were well on their way to burning to the ground. Um, uh, what needs to be noted at that fire is multiple times we were informed by the village that we were, uh, the reservoir had run out of water and we needed to stop pumping water. Um, at a certain point in, during that call, we made the decision to uh, switch from municipal water to pumping ocean water. Uh, that's a high risk activity, puts the members at a much higher risk because now they're down on the docks. Uh, Turtlehead, Bell Caribbean Road, 
Um, you have large houses on steep lots that you can only get access from, from one or two, or three sides, sorry. Uh, so it makes it very difficult. The other situation is that pumping salt water through our, our equipment is extremely hard on the equipment. Um, in fact, because of the turtle head fire, we lost one of our $10,000 pumps that pump so much salt water that uh, uh, the inside corroded up pretty good and we had to take the pump out of service. So <clears throat> that comment that, you know, all the water from Belicara wouldn't have changed the result, it, it, it wouldn't have changed the result. That, that house was fully involved when we got there. It, it was already burning to the ground. So the Sinclair Road fire too, um, a, a bit of a different circumstance in the sense that it was one house the fire was trapped in the attic space. We managed to keep it in the attic space. At one point uh, in that fire, I talked to the incident commander and he said, I've got one of the village staff uh, members here and we're monitoring the uh, reservoir. And there was multiple times during that event when we had to shut down our lines uh, because the water reservoir was getting low. And I know some people on the water committee meeting have looked at the SCADA data and determined that you know there was no um, uh, no issues with water supply. The big difference between looking at a spreadsheet and being on scene, completely different scenario. Um, at one point in that fire, I contacted Port Moody Fire and asked them if they would be available to possibly do a reverse lay into Sassamat Lake if we were going to have water issues with Belcara. So Port Moody sent their fire chief. He came down. At the time uh, Chief Colson got on scene. Uh, we pretty much had the fire contained to the attic structure and we didn't need any additional water resources. resources. I think one of the other comments I want to make about this is that any information that people need about what the fire department does and what we're doing, it needs to come from the fire chief or one of the deputy chiefs. Um, the issue that I have is when other people who are on the fire department comment on incidents, they're doing it from a limited perspective. When, I, when you get my comments on fire scenes, it's after I've talked to the incident commander, I may have been the incident commander, and we've done a full investigation because every dollar loss fire in Ann Warren, Belcara has to be investigated. Uh, the turtle head fire, I probably spent uh, close to a week investigating that. Um, I have obligations under the province to report back information to them. I, ha I have to work with the insurance companies. Uh, so there is a, a lot of work that's done to determine uh, how, you know, how the fire started, how it progressed, and, and all the kind of issues that we had. So I just want to caution people that if you want the, the official fire department version of facts, they need to come from the fire chief. Um, other than that, that's kind of what I want to clear up, that uh, both of those events, uh, the water system uh, uh, didn't supply the water we could have used. Um, and it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Again, turtle head, uh, it was a foregone conclusion. Sinclair Road was actually a good save on our behalf. Uh, we were able to keep the fire into the attic space of the house. Uh, the house did uh, suffer a bit of fair amount of water damage and it was determined by the insurance company that they were gonna rebuild it. So um, that's kind of the comments I had on that. I, I'd be welcome to take any questions if anyone wants clarification. Thank you, Chief Sharp. Uh, in advance of questions, can I get someone to move the item? I'll move it. Carolina? Carolina. Someone would like to second it? I'll second. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, your hands up. Thank you. And uh, let me start, uh, uh, Chief Sharp, by thanking you for everything you do uh, for the community as well as all the volunteers on the fire department. Uh, I was close to the two fires on Turtle Head, and as I mentioned to you before, that's uh, the difference between uh, uh, reading about uh, putting your head in a lion's mouth and having it in there. It's uh, quite a uh, terrifying uh, experience to see a, a fire of that size and uh, material burning as that was falling all around the site. So thank you to you and, and the uh, firefighters that dealt with that. Uh, I just have a couple of general questions that I, I would appreciate your comments on. Um, sprinklers in homes, could you comment on the utility of that? Uh, well, the fire department is in favor of sprinklered homes. So it's, uh, to me, it's a no brainer. S several yeah. homes in Belcara already have sprinklers and some of yeah. the water access homes 
that are water access only that have been built in the last, I think, 15 years, they, they're sprinklered as well too. So it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. Developers yeah. don't like sprinklers though. Just because of the added cost, I take it? Because of the added cost, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, tree and brush removal. Uh, underbrush removal, I guess. This, I mean, this is a hot topic. It's gotten attention from a, uh, a tree committee we've had in Valcara. Uh, and and my, my, my problem is this. I mean, if we cut down all the trees, we'd have no risk of any spread of fire, but the viewscapes would uh, suffer significantly. Can you, do, do you have a similar difficulty with the issue of clearance or am I misunderstanding the, this, the way in which this should be approached? Yeah, no, there are, there is a, a really good program. It's, it's available throughout Canada. It's called the, uh, the, the Fire Smart program. They make recommendations on, on what people can do to improve the fire safety of their houses. Uh, a lot of it's very simple stuff like cleaning your gutters, making sure your roof is cleaned off. Yep. Um, a lot of it's to do with uh, when the buildings are first built, like no cedar shake roofs, uh, hardy board siding, stuff like that, uh, yeah. you know, cedar, cedar decks with bark mulch around them, those are bad ideas. Trees overhanging houses, uh, branches overhanging houses. Uh, yeah, obviously if you cut down all the trees, you'd have zero risk, but that's not practical. But there's a significant number of homes in Belcara that have trees that are very close to the structure, uh, overhang the structure. And the risk is that if, if that fire, or that building catches on fire, you're gonna spread it to the trees, but if the ground's on fire, it's gonna to spread to the structure. So uh, yeah. I think Belcara really needs to look at adopting some fire smart principles. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Anmore just had a, a community uh, uh, presentation done by the, uh, one of the representatives from fire smart. Um, and it's just something that everybody should be uh, looking at. Okay, I, I have a few others, but I'll, I'll leave it at there. Others may have questions no, as well. There's, Thank there's, you. There isn't another hand up, Bruce. Go ahead, and I've got some oh. stuff. Okay, thank you so much. One, one issue that did come up with respect to the Turtle Head fire, and um, I know the answer to it, but uh, I think some people would appreciate hearing from you. Uh, some people had asked, why didn't we have a fire boat uh, come in given the scale of the fire? Well, see, this is, this is the thing that, uh, that I find frustrating is people make these assumptions that we didn't uh, exhaust all avenues. Um, so two things quickly. Number one is uh, the fire boat, we, there used to be a fireboat consortium that looked after the area. Belcara and Anmore were not part of the consortium. Um, if we ever brought the fireboat in, we would be paying uh, at a rate of, it was $8,000 per hour, um, which was something that was in our arsenal. If we needed to use it, we would have, um, yep. but we couldn't rely on it to show up. The day of the Turtle Head fire, I actually, so now there's only one, or there's two fireboats. They're both owned by the city of Vancouver. Um, the day of the Turtle Head fire, I did talk to the city of Vancouver. Uh, they had a fire boat on its way. By that point, it wouldn't have made any difference anyways. The outcome would have been the same. But yeah. the fire boat was on its way. But then I got a call about 15 minutes later to say that, sorry, we can't come because we've got a waterfront fire in uh, in Vancouver. And that takes uh, a fire over your issue. So. Understood. Uh, thank you. Uh, on that one, uh, Utility of monitored alarms in homes. It's something I've been looking at myself. And uh, uh, I assume this, the, the benefit here is getting people out of the house quickly and uh, getting the dispatch as quickly as possible. Correct. So most people, I'm hoping everybody actually has a, at least a smoke detector in their house uh, and hopefully multiple smoke detectors based on the number of floors and, and area that you have. But the advantage of a monitored alarm system is and I'll give you an example. We just had a structure fire in Anmore in the, in the spring, or sorry, last fall. And uh, the people were uh, out, of, out of the country, down in Arizona for a couple of months. Um, the fire started in the garage. They had no monitor alarm system, uh, but they did have a local smoke detector in the house. <clears throat> the neighbor noticed that fire at about 4.30 in the morning when he heard the glass break. Had that been an alarm system or a monitored system, there's a good chance that uh, the detectors would have gone off. The alarm company would get a signal. They would have called, uh, got a hold of uh, 911. <clears throat> we would have been dispatched. We would have been on scene. We could have potentially stopped that fire from, from advancing it the way it did. So 
That's the advantage of a monitored system. So a lot of older homes, they don't have monitored systems. They just have smoke detectors. It's good, but it's better to have a monitored system. The, the quicker we can get notified, the quicker we can get there and the quicker we can take action. I, I appreciate it. And it's probably, I mean, it's a, it's a question. I haven't given you any of these in advance, so I appreciate it may not be answerable, but do you actually think having monitored systems uh, would lead to a few minutes earlier notification of you, or do you have any, any basis on which to make that judgment? Well, uh, <clears throat> the hope is that you know, a monitored system will give you an early advance warning. The problem with monitored systems is they have to trigger an alarm to a dispatcher who has to call somebody, then they have to transfer the call and get it to us. So, um, and there's a lot of false alarms nowadays too, so people tend not to take them as serious as they should. Uh, we treat them all, we treat every alarm call we get as a fire call because uh, you just don't know until you get there. So, but I, I think the, the advantage is uh, it's, it's obvious. I can go on for some time, uh, Neil, but if you've got other questions, please. Still no, still no other hands up. You got the floor. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Homes. In the actual turtle head fire, as I recall, uh, you ended up having to shuttle the water in. There, the the, uh, the uh, uh, large tank we had up at Dutchman's Creek, we either didn't know or or it wasn't available to you. And I believe the water was ultimately shuttled uh, from the uh, uh, top of the big hill by the lake. Is that correct? Yeah, the water came from Anmore. Actually, don't tell them. We, we went to yeah, Crystal well, Creek sure. and hooked up to a fire hydrant at Crystal Creek and filled the shuttle, uh, the tanker up with that. Okay. And uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's as far as I can go with that question. Just the fact that the subsequent and, and hindsight's a wonderful thing. The, uh, yeah. the tank is now available, but it was not something that was known by our own staff, I guess, at the time. Well, here, here's the issue with Dutchman, and now it's been rectified. But at the time, that reservoir was out of service because the water hadn't been tested. So a number of years ago, we had a, an incident on Turtle Head. Um, we hooked up to that reservoir and there was gravel in the system and the gravel oh. through the pump and yeah. uh, uh, it was a thousand dollar rebuild. So to the fire truck for the pump. So we can't use a water source unless we're relatively confident that it's going to be uh, clean. It's clean. Yeah. So Dutchman Creek now has been cleaned up um, and uh, it, it's now available to us to use. But it wasn't then. In fact, it had an out-of-service sign on it back then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, huh? I think we're done. No, I, I have no other questions to ask you, Jay. Again, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. All right. So Carolina's next. Thank you. Um, Jay, I have just a couple of questions for you. The first question is, what's the response time for, for our department? I'll pick a time of the day. Time or kind of, of yeah. What, what people don't understand is uh, the SASMAT fire department has no guaranteed level of service. Yeah. Uh, what that means is that uh, it's 100% volunteer. Um, and uh, based on when the call comes in uh, and who's available, that determines how long it's going to take us to get there. Statistically, our response time is between 7 to 10 minutes, which is uh, fairly decent for a volunteer fire department. Yeah, that's pretty good. Thank you. And my second question, if you get to a fire, either on the first 15 minutes or let's say uh, an hour after you're fight, fighting the fire, uh, the fire jumps to the trees across in the forest. What is the procedure then? Okay, so the, and I, again, these are good questions. They're all hypothetical. Um, there's a, a million different answers for these questions too, but our main priority when we get to a structure fire is to protect the exposures to prevent that from happening to start with. So our, our focus, if we show up at a house fire uh, and there's trees or other exposures that are close by, we're gonna dedicate our initial resources to protecting those exposures to prevent the spread of fire. Then we move over to the containment where we try to contain the fire to the structure of origin. And then eventually we try and put it out. So it's, it's kind of, now if we go there and the fire jumps from the structure to the trees, obviously our, uh, our focus uh, changes. Um, in both Anmore and Belcara, 
uh, in the drier weather, when we get these calls, we do notify forestry that we have a structure fire in the interface zone, um, but they're gonna be an hour, a minimum of an hour before they get there. So uh, there's a good chance that there's gonna be a lot more damage done before we can get additional resources in. Fort Moody um, is not a, a reliable resource in the sense that they carry very limited water on their trucks because they have municipal systems everywhere. They carry about 300 gallons of water. Our trucks carry a thousand gallons. Um, so, and then Port Moody, what they would have to do, they would have to call, they would have to backfill their stations with their on-call people. Um, so we're gonna have a, a wait there while they get their halls manned up while, while their other members come to the call. So it's, uh, again, every, such an, every scenario would be different. Okay, and, um, and just a third question that popped up. We do have a tender, right, that holds 1,200 liters? That's of water? 1,200 gallons. Gallons, sorry, yeah. Okay, was that used during the Turtle Head fire or the same part? Times, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. That's all for now, thanks, Jay. For clarity, Carolina, the tender is what actually brings the water back and forth from the source to the fire. Oh, yes, I know that. Thank you. Okay, so, that, so that's the only way to get it. So it was used for that's every- That's the only, okay, so it was used many times. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next up is Deborah. Deborah Struck. There we go. There we go. Um, so for, I was on the tree committee and we were looking at a number of different things to do with, of course, trees and fires. And um, one of the things that I has come to our knowledge and we had recommended in terms of people that are cutting down trees to replace them with certain species that are not as flammable. So I guess my question is um, to Jay in the sense that you had said you're looking at what's around the fires and what should be done. So moving forward, should perhaps wherever there is a renovation or, or a new build, would it not be diligent on the part of Belcara to actually ask people to clear their lots to get rid of the um, coniferous trees. And because my understanding with the coniferous trees, they if they light, they ignite, they'll just, and that's the problem. Whereas with some other species of um, non-coniferous trees that they are better to have on the property. Is that true, Jay Sharp? Well, I'm not a <laughs> tree okay. expert, but in general terms that uh, evergreens are uh, more uh, combustible than, than uh, deciduous trees for sure. Um, and some evergreen trees, such as Douglas fir, are highly combustible. Cedar trees are highly combustible. Hemlock are not as combustible, but uh, yes, that, that's something that you could look at. Or just keep trees away from your building. Right. And, and would that also not present, let's say, let's say we did have a wildfire. Um, in terms of our exit from the village, we have a lot of Douglas fir and cedar lining the roads just in the properties and whatnot on the road. So that would create a problem too, would it not? It for evacuation on yeah, the road? Potentially, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Don, you're up. Oh, hi. Um, Chief Sharp, I got three questions for you if I could. Uh, first is uh, in the barnacle recently, Doug Brain. Uh, wrote an article and it implied we never ran out of water. At least that's how I read the article in, in the barnacle. Uh, and I'd just like to get your comment on that. Uh, and which event are you referring to? Uh, uh, Doug Brain's uh, uh, article in the in the barnacle. I don't know if you had an opportunity to read that or not. I, I did read it, but I um, I don't know what event that you're referring to that he wrote. Oh, about. the turtle. Head, I'm sorry, the turtle head fire. We didn't run out of water. That, that's what I kind of read between the lines. There is what he was trying. We we uh, we were told multiple times by village staff that the reservoir was getting depleted and we needed to stop flowing water. So if if you want to say we ran out of water, then that would be a fair statement. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I've also heard in my walks through the village that some have said that if we used foam more than we do uh, currently, or if we use more foam, we don't need more water supply than we currently have in the village of Belterra. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so I've heard, I've heard the comments too. There's two types of foam I think that people are talking about. 
Uh, there's Class A foam, which our trucks, we've had Class A foam on our trucks since 1990. Um, we were one of the first departments in North America to actually spec a truck with Class A foam capabilities on it. Class A foam uh, uh, is great. It, it uh, increases the uh, heat absorption rate for, for the water. Um, it allows water to cling ver to vertical surfaces because it's a foam. We already use foam in all of our structure fires, so it's something that we already do. The other thing I think that I've heard about too is a, uh, compressed air foam systems, which is a, a, a slightly different, well, it's a much different version than uh, class A foam. Um, class, or calf systems are, uh, they're limited in use. We don't have them. Uh, they're expensive, uh, they're high, high maintenance, and they're kind of one of those, uh, those things that sound really cool, but the reality that most fire departments actually don't use them be, because of their limitations and they're not all that they're uh, made out to be. And, and I, I think Don, one of the frustrations I have is that if there was a solution that was that, that simple, we would have already done it. So, so using foam to a greater extent than what the department has used up until this point in time is not the answer. Well, you can't use it any more than we already use it. We okay. Already, we already use Class A foam for, for our fires. Well, for me, that puts that argument to rest. And lastly, which I think this conversation is all about, is do we have adequate water supply in our village or not? And I've, 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 I've heard, I've read where people think we don't, uh, pe don't need additional water. Uh, uh, we've got adequate supply. Other people think we need to build uh, an expensive reservoir to give us adequate supply. Are you able to share your opinion on whether we need to invest more uh, uh, to get uh, an adequate water supply for Belcara to fight fires uh, more over than what we have right now? Well, it's a very difficult question for the volunteer fire chief to answer. Um, certainly, if we had more water available, we would certainly use it. Um, but I think it's a question of Belcara needs to decide what their risk tolerance is. Um, uh, I don't, personally, I don't think the water system is adequate, but I got to tell you, it's a heck of a lot better than what we had before in Belcara when we only had tanker shuttles. So um, is it what it needs to be? I don't think it is, but it's better than what we had. So, so, so looking at the turtle head fire, uh, it was fortunate it happened when it did because I was I was here at that time and there was uh, uh, the, the the forest was wet although we did see some of the uh, trees uh, with the heat go into a candle uh, situation um, if if that had happened two months later and the forest had been dry what then it it could have been a, it could have been an evacuation not a not a fire suppression activity. Yeah, it just, I mean, we, were, we were fortunate the turtle head fire happened when it did. Uh, is that fair to say? I, w I would agree with that, yeah. Okay, and, and, if we, and, and if we experienced that some months later with the water supply that we currently have, we would be regretting not having made an investment in getting more water. Would that be a fair statement as well? I, again, that's one of those loaded questions that, uh, you know, it, certainly the outcome could have been a lot worse than what it was. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief Sharp. Thank you. So quick, uh, a quick comment um, that I can add a little bit more color because I'm not sure everybody understands if they haven't been to a fire. Both, I was running the pump at both the Turtlehead and the Sankler fire when we had to turn it off. And I can tell you that when we turned it off, it wasn't right when we arrived and when the fire was not scary and it was inside, of, inside the structure and it didn't look threatening. We, we were turning off the, 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 uh, the, the nozzles when, they were, when the fire was fully engulfed and going out through the top of the houses or, uh, or, or at risk of, of catching into the fire as it tried to escape the house because it was further into the fire. And so uh, Captain Speakin and myself and on the Sinclair fire had to turn down the monitor, which is the most powerful nozzle. As, it was, as, the, as the tree was getting licked with fire, we had to turn it off and then come back on and try to stop the tree from candling and turn it off. And put it back on again, and uh, and, and a tur turtle head fire. You saw the trees are still burned up beside, uh, and that again, that was when we were having to turn the hoses off. Was when we were able, when we were stopping. Um, we didn't have all the tools available that we might have had we had more water. 
I just wanted to offer that perspective that you run out of water later if the fire is getting out of control. You don't run out of water early while it still looks self-contained, which is why you try to flow as much as you can when you first arrive. So I just want to give at least that, that ex experiential piece as well. Is there anything else from the gallery in advance? Uh, I want to thank Chief Sharp again uh, for taking the time to join us today and for everything you do and volunteering. Thanks. I, can I just make one final comment here? Please. Um, I heard some discussion in Belcara too from some of the people uh, about uh, the, the volume of water that we were able to get from the, from the Belcara water system. And it was, it was a very large number. And the comment made was that, you know, the Belcara system far exceeds the requirements because we got all this amount of water. When you're fighting a structure fire, you need a lot of water in a very short period of time. So, you know, to make the statement that because we were able to flow a lot of water through uh, the system in a long period of time, that that's a good thing, that's not a good thing. We need a lot of water in a short period of time, not a lot of water over an extended period of time. And that's the difference between saving a structure and saving a foundation. Thanks, Chief Sharp. Appreciate again your time. Uh, so we are going to, Vote to accept the presentation. All in favor? Aye. None opposed? Motion carried. Thanks. Again, Chief Sharp, thank you for your input. You certainly don't have to hang around if you don't find this absolutely captivating. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move back to 5.2 and Guy Patterson, I'm hoping he has joined us. Guy Patterson. Yes, he has, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Lorna, for the confirmation. So Guy Patterson for 5.2 is gonna provide a verbal report regarding sharing legal opinions. And this comes out of the conversation we had at the last council meeting, where there's a question around transparency. So Guy, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for your, uh, thank you for what you're about to present. I'm trying to unmute you, but I can't, Guy. Do you wanna try and unmute yourself? Done, sorry about that. No worries. Please go ahead. So you can hear me now? We can hear you now. Um, so, uh, I, I will admit to being a little bit, I, I guess, or at least initially, I was a little bit unclear as to what exactly the, the, the council was looking for here, but my understanding, um, and you could maybe correct me if I'm wrong about this, um, and that'll help me to give this report in a more effective manner, but my understanding is that council has been considering the possibility of um, disclosing past legal advice the village has received uh, to the public generally. Uh, and specifically, uh, what I understand the, the village council has been considering is, I guess, and, and again, this is where I maybe I'm mistaken, but a, a motion that uh, the village council would, I guess, direct staff to disclose, um, I guess, all of, uh, or a sort of a body of, of legal advice, as opposed to any particular piece of advice that, um, the village might have received in a given period of time or in relation to a particular matter. And um, if I'm not mistaken in understanding that as being kind of, I guess, the village's question, uh, my um, advice to date on the, on the, I guess, on the point has been that I, I think, and I think most lawyers would agree with this, um, I would be nervous um, about a, decision to disclose um, legal advice generally or um, in, a, in a manner other than sort of a case-by-case case basis. Um, so I can explain why I say I would be nervous about that if, if that is what would be sort of helpful and if I'm on the right track in understanding what you're interested in me discussing yeah. this evening. You're on the right track. I'll, I'll add a little bit more color for you. Uh, the, the issue arose with a specific recommendation from, from council around road ends, and then it grew to a overall transparency issue about council wanting to be transparent and being challenged for not being transparent about uh, legal opinions that were paid for by residents. And if the legal opinions didn't involve litigation or if uh, they didn't touch on staffing as two areas that would typically be obviously be dealt with in camera meetings and should have the confidentiality associated with them, for all the other opinions that aren't staffing and aren't lit litigation related, why would we not uh, share at least the summary, if not the entire opinion with the residents who paid for the actual opinions? 
Um, I, I guess there is, I, in my view, there is certainly a big distinction between sharing a summary and sharing the opinion itself. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and I, I still, I guess I would say, um, I would be careful about um, any decision to disclose, again, some collective group of opinions or you know, any broad category of legal advice the village has received. Um, and I, I guess I could provide a bit more um, on that point, but um, that's really, I guess, the, the, the take, my take is that for sure summaries generally better than the whole opinion. Although again, if you're doing it on a case by case basis, there might be lots of scenarios where an entire opinion would be, could be disclosed without, um, you know, any risk or, you know, any, any lawyer being nervous about the disclosure of the whole opinion. Um, so yeah, summary versus whole opinion, not as big of a concern if it's, if the decision to waive or I should say disclose um, is made on a case by case basis. A decision, again, a decision to waive a whole bunch, that's where I guess I, I get nervous. Why do you get nervous? Um, because I, I, I guess, always, and again, in litigation or no, if there's no active litigation, then I still say there's always a risk that there could be something in an opinion, um, uh, again, that, that the village hadn't specifically considered um, that might give rise to litigation if a, if a, if a solicitor had identified some risk of, of legal exposure. Um, and, you know, no one knew about that risk because it was only in an opinion that had been given. Um, I don't know if it would be in the village's interests for transparency to disclose that and sort of trigger someone who was looking for a reason to sue the village, I guess. Um, that's maybe a, I guess that's sort of the simplest way to, to, to put it. And your, your level of concern on the summary of opinions now, because we, we, have, we have shared in this specific instance for road ends, we have shared the summary and the resident is challenging us for the full opinion. Can you give us an example? Uh, can you give us your thoughts on that example as to whether or not it'd be appropriate to share? Well, I guess on that, in that case, I would say, um, I, would, I would imagine the village, you know, the council would probably individually um, read whatever the full opinion is, whether that's a series of emails or, you know, one letter wrapped up in a bow that says legal opinion on it. Um, I would imagine village councillors each reviewing that um, probably, and well, I, I did talk to Lorna a bit about this um, and sort of deciding that there's nothing in that opinion that, the, that any of the members of council are concerned about or that the majority of the members of council are concerned about. Um, or, you know, perhaps if there's questions, they might consult a lawyer and say, we're thinking about disclosing this opinion, you know, um, in your opinion, does, would, would the disclosure expose the village to any risk? Um, so in either scenario, again, not saying you have to ask a lawyer whether or not to disclose, but I would have thought that um, you might want to turn your mind to the content of the full opinion before deciding to disclose a full opinion. I guess that's all. Same as the summary, really. If, if the summary is being disclosed, you just want to know what, what people are being told. Um, and uh, and it's, I guess it's hard. Yeah, I think it's hard to make a, a decision um, on the risks and weigh the risks without knowing exactly what advice we're proposing to, to, to disclose. So is it fair to say you feel that the summary is less risky to, to release than the full opinion? Either could be done on a case by case basis, you feel, uh, and yet you still have concerns that despite it might, despite something not pertaining to litigation or to staff, you wouldn't just as a rule think that the resident should have access to the summaries. Uh, yeah, I would say, again, I would, I would never, I would never give the advice to, to make a blanket decision uh, about a, a body of opinions or a number of opinions. Um, I, I did consider the possibility, for example, you might have like a kind of a proactive disclosure policy, say, with respect to legal advice received. Um, and maybe you would have like a set of criteria that either council itself would consider or perhaps a member of staff would consider. And that way, maybe it could sort of be a shortcut and, and make it more, um, make it more sort of more likely and more expeditious to disclose opinions from time to time, or, you know, in the event that advice is received. Um, so yeah, I guess to me, anything, anytime you're just saying, um, 
you know, here's a broad category of legal opinions. Anytime we receive a legal opinion that doesn't have to do with X, Y, or Z, we're going to automatically disclose it. That's where I get nervous again, because I don't think you know until you have the whole, all of the advice, whether or not there might be some risk associated with it. Um, if you do, if it is disclosed and privilege is waived. Bruce, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, uh, Neil. And uh, thank you, Guy. Question on the, um, so what, what I think I hear you saying is you, you should look case by case. You could have a policy of doing that in, a, in an expeditious fashion. Uh, the one concern that makes sense to me is the potential for litigation. Obviously, we're not sharing litigation advice if we're in an actual litigation, uh, but that we should also weigh the potential for litigation given the issue that's uh, before us. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I suppose maybe a slight gloss on that would just be the potential that the, that the advice could be harmful to the village's interests yeah. uh, if it were to be disclosed and privilege waived. I mean, that's the real crux of the issue to me. Um, you know, the, the sort of the core of the principle is solicitor-client privilege is sort of sacred. Um, yeah. Privileges arises in the context of legal advice. The reason for that is the, is the idea that potentially waiving or being forced to disclose advice or waiving privilege over the advice could be harmful to the interests. And, and I mean, that's, that's the big thing. There are other residual factors, but. Yeah. As we played about with this, and it was a recent issue, as uh, Neil indicates, uh, some of us came to the conclusion, well, if it wasn't illegal, we should do it. Is it ever illegal to share legal advice that you've been given? That's certainly the exception. The basic theory is that it's for the client to decide, the client being right. the village. It's the client's, the, the client yeah. is the one who gets the privilege over the advice. And yeah. ultimately, it's, it's almost always up to the client to decide. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's never, you can never say never in these things. And, and finally, I, I take it as a given that you never share anything to do with staff issues. Would that be an absolute case or could you see exceptions even there? Well, you know, I don't do tons of work in the labor and employment field. Okay. Uh, so I, I couldn't really give you, uh, I, I could look, I, I obviously do research and we have experts that are our firm on that, but yeah. I, I wouldn't want to make a comment. No, oh, yeah. thank you very much. I think you've given me all the information that I need. Thank you, Neil. Bruce. So from the gallery, uh, I'd love to hear some feedback. We have 13 legal opinions that have, that do not include litigation or uh, staffing related issues. And I don't know if everybody knew there's that many. Uh, one of them obviously is pertaining to the road end, which has been shared and prompted this conversation. But uh, this came up because residents paid for those opinions. Now those opinions wouldn't have been sought in the first place if there wasn't concern about legal entitlement or, or legal risk. And so there's always gonna be a legal risk that you, you, you weigh to make the investment in getting the opinion in the first place to guide you to balance that risk for legal. Um, so if any, anyone from the gallery has any comments or questions as well or thoughts on whether or not we should be sharing, these opinions, please. And Carolina, you've got your hand up. Thank you. So I just want to make a comment on how this came about. And obviously, it was on the road and Dave Goodman asked for that one specific legal advice. I don't recall anybody else asking for all of the advices. Uh, the first time I heard from this, it was actually from the mayor that suggested uh, that we would, disclose, we would disclose the other legal advices. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to make that comment for now. I, you know, to me, I do like the idea of doing on a case by case um, scenario. Um, and yeah, so yeah, those are my comments for now. Thank you. Sure. To, to backfill that, the, um, the comment about the, ro about the road ends was brought up and it was, and in the letter back and forth about the road ends being released, the actual full opinion, the, the comment came up about the council declaring that it wanted to be transparent and yet is not being transparent about this decision. And how can a council declare that it's transparent if it doesn't share these opinions that were paid for by the residents? Well, that was your comment though. <laughs> My comment was in return to the challenge that we weren't being transparent with our legal opinions. And it's no, the, the challenge, I disagree. The challenge, you know, it was, yeah, you can see it as a challenge because, uh, because you said, you know, you feel that you're so transparent, you should share it. But I just want to make it clear to everybody that he was asking for that one specific legal opinion, not for a policy that blankets all of the legal opinions. I do believe, I agree with Guy, 
I do believe that it would put the village on a very vulnerable position. Every legal advice that we get could be a potential litigation in the future. So I do think we need to be very, very wise about this. Um, I do appreciate uh, your willingness to be transparent, but, uh, but we do have to remember that we, it, it wouldn't be wise, in my opinion, to put the village in such, um, in such position if you were to do a policy or just release all of the advice. Thank you. Thanks. So Guy, could you even be in conflict about releasing these types of things? I mean, this is a, this is a big, this is a discussion about a policy. Can, can, can people actually be in conflict about the political, the actual policy for a transparency piece? Uh, could an individual council member be in conflict when making it? When yeah, or myself, or myself. Sorry, sir, I, I, I think I cut you off. Is that I could be in conflict or that a councillor? Yeah, anyone on council, myself included, if, if I wanted to stop something from coming out, uh, would I would actually be, you know, is there a risk of even being in conflict and having this as a policy versus on a case-by-case -case basis? If you were trying to, you think, like, like if, you're, if your fellow councillors thought something should be disclosed and you didn't want it to be disclosed and it was because of some, for some personal reason? Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that the, the starting point is that, uh, that the, uh, the legal advice is privileged and uh, it's up to the client being the village to choose whether or not to waive privilege in any, in any case. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, guess, I, I guess an individual council member at, at, at a moment in time might say, oh, I, it, it's a conflict for me to participate in this discussion about whether or not to disclose this opinion. I, I suppose that could happen. Uh, it's kind of, it seems a bit hypothetical, but yeah, I, I, couldn't just, I couldn't say it would never happen. Okay, thank you. Deborah. Hi. Go ahead, Deborah. I just wanted, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. I just wanted to clarify that, yeah, I did hear through the last one that there was somebody that was challenging you to do with transparency and thinking that things did need to be exposed or that you did need to. So that's, that's all I wanted to say that, that yeah. And so I'm thankful that uh, Mr. Patterson is here today to clarify as to when it's wise and you can. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah, of course. Anytime someone challenges the council on an overall transparency issue, not just with one piece, you can't be only transparent about one thing. You're either transparent or you're not. Totally agree. Uh, Don, you're up next. Any other hands up? Don? Pardon me. Don, there you go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, if the mayor or uh, a councillor uh, declares a conflict of interest on a particular issue um, and they had previously voted for um, or voted on that particular issue prior to uh, declaring a conflict of interest. Uh, what does that do for any of the votes that happened uh, prior to declaring that conflict, conflict of interest on that same subject where they voted? Guy? Is that a conflict question or a, or a disclosure of legal advice question? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, you decide. I, I just not, I'm not really sure if I can get, I can, I, I don't see, I, I would have to go and look at the conflict rules again. I, I didn't, I, I didn't review that legislation before tonight. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, David's iPad Air. I think this is Dave Goodman. Go ahead. Yes, it is Dave Goodman. And just to cl clarify, so I was the person that raised the, the issue at the last meeting, and I was asking for the specific legal opinion, um, not, not in general but for that specific one. Uh, <clears throat> but my question to the lawyer is this, is in formulating your legal opinions that you provide to counsel, uh, <clears throat> do you just solely focus on the legal ramifications or do you also 
consider the ethical and moral obligations to live up to the intent of the law as opposed to the specific wording of the law. I just want to confirm, Your Worship, that, that you're happy for me to take questions other than from counselors. I assume that's I, I am absolutely happy for you to take questions, please. This is all the transparency. Sure. Um, well, my practice is to answer the question that the client asks. No, but I, I guess I'm, I'm asking for clarification on what a legal opinion consists of. Does it just simply consist of interpreting the law with respect to that specific issue or does it take other considerations into account such as the intent of the law? Well, I, would, I don't think you can really separate out. Um, I don't think any lawyer would sort of ignore the intent of the law when giving a client an opinion about how the law would be interpreted. But again, I, I mean, I, I would go back to my original point that I, I will do my best to answer, to give the legal advice that the client is looking for. But again, for sure, if, if the lawyer's view is that there is a sort of a spirit of the law component of it and that, and that is, that's part of the legal advice. It's not, I don't think there's a separate issue. I mean, of, uh, I mean, for sure, a lawyer might be asked for strategic advice, but um, or it may or I might ask for ethical or moral advice. I typically think that's um, the role of the council in the work that we do. But but for sure, uh, in giving legal advice, I think the, uh, the spirit of the law is part of the legal uh, part of the lawyer's job is to understand what what's the court going to do with this uh, with this issue ultimately. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Guy? I don't see any other hands up. Anyone from the gallery? Comments? Deborah Struck, please go ahead. Deborah, you'll need to unmute yourself, okay? Hi, it's Peter, 4575 Belcara Bay Road. Hi, Peter. Hi. Um, I'm just curious whether things have changed. Um, have, has, have you, Neil, or any of the staff read the actual opinion letter yet? The, the opinion on the road ends question? Well, you know, sir, sir, that's correct. The opinion on the road ends have, have um, I'm asking whether, now to you and the counselors, whether, whether any of you have read the actual opinion letter? I believe I've only seen the summary. Lauren, have you shared the full opinion with counsel? Yes, Your Worship, the full opinion was shared with counsel. There you go. Has any other, has any other council member read the actual opinion letter? It, were, it was shared with all of council. So, so uh, Bruce, have you read the actual opinion letter? I accept the uh, learned statement if she said she shared with council, undoubtedly, yeah, we've all seen it, yeah. So Rob, have you read the actual opinion letter? What I've read is what Lorna provided at our council meeting in regard to this. If that was in fact the opinion letter, then yes. If that was a summary, then no. Okay, well there is, a, so Lorna, do you uh, share the actual opinion letter and your summary or, 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 or just one of the two? I believe I've answered that. Okay. And um, are, are, are we the public allowed to find out who in staff was able to read, um, besides Lorna, able to read the opinion letter and the original letter? There would be no one other than myself, Your Worship. Peter, I think just, just I think one of the things that you see the uncertainty, at least on council, is it, we didn't get presented by Lorna, I don't think, a letterhead summary. We were provided an email that uh, that was a multiple paragraphs, but it wasn't a letterhead summary, so it wasn't clearly indicated. I think in that it was a what was a full it was a full opinion, or if it was a summary, which is why you see that the, the disconnect. I, I have 100% confidence that everybody on council reads all the emails, and so it's just I think in this case uh, we would have read something that we just couldn't be sure was a summary or a, a, over the entire or, or the entirety of a legal opinion. So so I'm asking on behalf of myself and other residents if we would be. Uh, myself and others would be allowed to 
to perhaps come down to Village Hall and actual, actually look at both those documents. I can understand why having a copy of it for circulation might be a negative thing to do. And I'd like to know what um, the lawyer and counselors um, think about um, myself and others being able to actually read both the summary and the original document without taking a copy of it of any kind whatsoever. Well, at this time, the village hall is still close to the public, but I will leave the rest of the response to um, Guy Patterson. Go ahead, please, Guy. Well, I guess one thing I'll just point out is that um, the, there, in my view anyway, I, the, the, there's no sort of magic distinction about an opinion uh, you know, provided on letterhead versus uh, uh, legal advice given in email. Uh, from, for me anyway, um, you know, my legal advice may be one or two paragraphs in a quick email. It may be in a, law, a six page letter with a letterhead on it. As far as the question of, of, le of the solicitor client privilege goes, the, the question is simply whether the, whether the communication in question is legal advice. And if it is, then it's privileged. And, and that's where the, the village will decide whether or not to waive privilege um, and disclose it. And the manner of disclosure, whether it be by posting it on the website or inviting everyone to come down to the hall to have a look at it, probably doesn't make too much difference as far as whether or not uh, it would be considered by a court that privilege over the legal advice has in fact been waived. Thank you, Bruce, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Neil. And it seems to me uh, that, that the, the advice that we're getting is that you, re you need to go case by case. It seems to me if your objective is transparency then it would be appropriate to uh, that we commit ourselves to upon request sitting and reviewing a given document and making a decision in a timely fashion. I don't see what else you can do. I mean, you obviously, I think uh, Guy has, has laid out the criteria and uh, we, it's simply a matter of the council sitting down on any request and responding quickly. Guy, do you have any comment? Well, like I say, I mean, I think you could have a more, if you wanted to, you could probably have a more proactive disclosure kind of policy as opposed to waiting for requests. You could say every, as soon as we get a morsel of legal advice, we're going to automatically put that through the screening test and decide whether or not yeah. to disclose Good it. Good point. But um, uh, yeah, so I guess that's the only minor distinction I'd make. Thanks, Guy. We've got a, a chat. We've got a chat room comment from uh, Alex Bryce. Uh, Alex, I, I think I understand where you're going with this, but it wouldn't alleviate, obviously, the risk if you were looking to litigate yourself. Can we use an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement to give the community access to the legal information we're discussing? Would, a, would an NDA at all protect the village in any of these cases, Guy? You mean I will, I, I'll, I'll share with it, this legal advice with you if you promise not to use it against me? Well, that's not an NDA, but that's what I mean. Like, I well, think you an, promise an not to tell anyone else about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a promise not to tell is what an NDA is. But yeah. if there was a release not to use it against, I guess what people, including Alex, maybe at the heart of this is: is there something we can do to give people access to the to these legal opinions where they're legally entitled to them, uh, because uh, they're not based on staffing or litigation, and uh, uh, and, and um, we're trying to be transparent here. I'm not sure if they're ever legally entitled to them, um, but, but, uh, but anyway, um, I think any time, I mean, the council, every time, every time the council, um, well, look, you could have a policy to disclose everything uh, for sure and risks be damned and, and, and don't listen to the, to, the, to the lawyers, you know, fussing about it. Uh, it that's open to the council to decide. The privilege is for the, is for the council to waive or not. Yeah. Um, I did, I did, I do have one, you know, when I was wondering about the of, of sort of a, a policy of disclosing legal advice that you haven't yet received, I, 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 there might even be an issue around that because there is no privilege to waive yet. So that might even be problematic. But in terms of advice that exists, where the privilege exists, the privilege is counsels to waive, again, subject to some uh, illegality exception that I haven't thought of. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess I, I, as a lawyer, I would say weigh transparency against other uh, other things that the village should be keeping in mind when deciding what to do in its business. Um, but but again, if the council is so determined to 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 favor transparency over whatever other risks might exist, um, then so be it. That that's it's not for me to tell you not to disclose. It's for me to identify the risks of disclosure and the risks of a waiver of privilege. 
All right, thanks. Alex, you've also got your hand up. If I didn't capture your comment correctly, do you want to, do you want to uh, add to that? Yeah, so um, I, I think you captured what I was trying to get at pretty well. I mean, I think that there's obviously a lot of people who are really curious about what the legal opinion was. I completely understand, I believe your name is Guy, your perspective on um, obviously weighing your, your fiduciary duty to the village council. Um, uh, and I'm just, you know, I, I don't know what the best way to approach this would be, but clearly there's a whole bunch of questions in the village in terms of, you know, what the opinion is and what the overall risks are, because I think um, Guy, and you could sort of speak to this, um, there's going to be positive and negative risk no matter what happens, no matter what decision is made, correct? About the, about the disclosure, you mean? Not about, well, so of course there's risk in the disclosure depending on what is written, but <clears throat> in terms of the overall decision to sell off road ends. Well, I, I mean, I, don't, I guess, yeah, if, if, uh, if, we're, if we're talking about a decision to sell off road ends, I suppose I, I would be reluctant to, without council's instruction to give any uh, kind of advice about that in a, in a public meeting, but I mean, I'm happy to do that if there's a question that, that, that you want me to answer. We, we shared the summary already. Um, you know, uh, is, there, is, there, is there something outside of the summary, Alex, that you're trying to, you're trying to understand? I think there's broad questions in the last town hall meeting, if, if I recall, that were centered around the specifics. And so, um, you know, again, in, in, in my professional life, we use NDAs all the time to get into, you know, more open conversations. And I thought that would be a benefit. Okay, point taken. I don't, it doesn't sound like Guy says that an NDA is gonna be the most impactful, a, a release possibly, uh, if we got to that point. But uh, again, Guy also did indicate, and Guy, I'll get you to speak up please, but capture this incorrectly. It's possible that the summary is less risky anyways, and that um, dealing, dealing more on a summary basis might be a less risky way to be able to communicate the, uh, the content. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not as fussed about the distinction between the summary and, and, and some full opinion, whatever that might be. I'm, I'm more really interested in what is the um, advice that's proposed to be disclosed. And in this case, I don't actually know what the advice that is proposed to be disclosed is which I think is better. It helps, probably helps me give you a more objective view of, this, of the scenario. But, um, you know, if, so I, I could imagine a, a council asking uh, its, its lawyers, its solicitors advice, look, we've, we're getting lots of public pressure to give, to disclose more information that everyone knows we've got a legal opinion about such and such an issue. Um, you know, here's the advice we'd like to disclose. And we, we get requests all the time saying, oh, here's a summary of the advice we're thinking about disclosing, run it by the lawyers, see what they think. If there's some risk we haven't thought of, let us know. And you might, and then you might also say, "Oh, we've got this idea of an NDA. We've got this idea of a release. Would that assist us?" But again, I, I would be hard pressed to give any good advice if I didn't actually see what advice, what you know, what it is that was going to be disclosed, and what were the terms of this proposed NDA or release. Thanks. Everything's on the table, right? Like it, when the village is trying its best to balance its various priorities. Of course, I mean we're gonna we're gonna respect that when giving our advice, but ultimately you know, we'll answer the question, what are the risks? And, and maybe we'll say there are no risks. That is, a, it's an innocuous couple of paragraphs, go for it. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Thank you, sir. Stuart, you're uh, next. Stuart, go ahead, we can hear you now. Hello, um, I just want to speak in very general terms, uh, but uh, what I'm used to experiencing is if uh, anybody had any kind of requests for this, it would uh, be forwarded for uh, the manager to review the file and redact as necessary. So in other words, if there was uh, any sensitive type uh, paragraphs or issues, certain information would be redacted specifically. Good comment. It's an option, obviously, if there's going to be a release to have redactions included in it as, as, uh, as, as per, uh, I suppose, whatever policy or, or risk could be associated with between the legal opinion and, and council's decision. Um, Dave Goodman, you're next. Thank you. Um, once Mr. Patterson is done, could you follow up on Mr. Drake's suggestion that you deal with these on a um, specific basis, given that there was a specific request at the last meeting? Could we get closure on that at today's meeting? 
I don't. So the, 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 what you hear me trying to work through is I don't know if this is the venue for council to decide whether or not to release the full opinion uh, or if council would prefer to have that in camera um, because not everybody has the same desire for transparency. Um, I, I'm on record. I want all 13 to go out right now. I want everybody to have access to at least the summaries, uh, all of them. And not everybody feels that way. And so I don't know if this is the place to have that, uh, that debate. Uh, Bruce, you got your hand up. Do you want to comment? Yes, uh, thanks, Neil. Yeah, and, and uh, Dave, thanks for, for the comment. I mean, what I was, just to be clear, uh, what seemed to me to make sense based on the advice we've been given is to assure timely response. Uh, and I think that it will be a case by case situation. I mean, I take guys a point that uh, we could, and whenever we do review a legal opinion, uh, one item on the table could be, do we have any objection to releasing it, whether anyone asks for it or not? That's step one. The second is, I think we should meet quickly, and I would do it in camera, because in some cases you're going to decide not to release, and I think council should have the opportunity to discuss uh, the material they're going to release, discuss the implications, and form a judgment uh, as to whether it's in the long-term interest of the municipality, which is really the responsibility that each of us carries. So uh, what I was suggesting is uh, is timely when a request such as yours come in that you get an answer from council in a short order. Thank you. Thanks Bruce. Uh, what I might propose, there's no other hands up, what I might propose is in the in the absence of a policy, uh, Dave and anybody else who has any interest in any of those other uh, those other opinions, communicate to staff. Send staff a, a formal written request for either a summary or an in-depth opinion and staff can put it on an agenda for an in-camera meeting for council to discuss. Uh, and that would probably be the most effective way, at least in the short term, for us to be able to address any of the different, uh, any of the different items and try to address the transparency piece. Um, I don't think it's gonna happen in this meeting, uh, Dave uh, Goodman. It, uh, as much as I know you'd like it, I think that there's different degrees of concern that need to be addressed within council. Deborah, you're next, or perhaps Peter. There, I think I'm unmuted now. There we are. Good. Go ahead, please. Neil, I'm very happy to hear that you are for transparency and releasing these things. I have no idea why any why any one councillor at all would not want to disclose the the road end um, opinion letter because it's such an important hot topic within the community, and um, and for that reason, the, the the entire faith of the council being appropriate is established by them being 100% on side to disclosing anything that they know whatsoever about this road end thing. Um, and um, Bruce talked about the long term, uh, good for the, for the community of releasing this. No, it's not just the long term, it's short term, middle term and long term. It's, I believe it's for the benefit of the community on all those terms to release this. It's highly sought after by many people. There's no valid reason to withhold it. In, in my opinion, nobody is looking for a lawsuit, but this very contentious issue, um, everybody involved would like to know what's really going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Carolina. Yes, thank you. Just to Peter's comment, I don't think any counselor said no to disclose that a specific one. Uh, you didn't ask that question, but I, I can see by your comment that perhaps you assumed that, um, that some of us are against sharing that specific legal opinion. I think what you're hearing here is concerns about sharing or doing a blanket policy on many legal opinions. I do agree with you that there has been so much concern about this one opinion. I would be in favor of releasing opinions based if, it's, if it has to do anything with policy and if there is so many questions from the villagers. So I just wanna make that clear, thank you. Your Worship, I would support having a closed council meeting for council to review the decision or the legal opinion and then decide if it, they want it to be released. Thanks. Perhaps we can Thank consider you. a policy discussion at the same time, Lorna, uh, to see if there's a, a degree of um, process that we can communicate to residents as well around an overarching opinion. For sure. We might not have a policy developed, but you could have the discussion for sure. Exactly. All right. Uh, are there any other comments or questions while we have Guy on the line? All right, I think I forgot to move this. So shall we move the item, please? Anybody? 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 Hello? Hello? I'll, I'll move it, Neil. Bruce is moving it. 
Second. Second. It's going to be hard to take this one back if no one's willing Pastor to Beg had his hand up. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself to catch because they're not all, not everybody's on my screen. Uh, so you're seconding Rob and nothing else to add. All in favor? Aye. Uh, unopposed. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Guy. I appreciate the time uh, in what is obviously a complex and, uh, and in some cases um, tense issue. And so we really appreciate you being available for us uh, to be able to give the Q and A. No problem. Thanks for having me. Have a good night. Thank Have you. Good night. All right, let's move to 5.4. And this is Chris, Be Chris Boyce, our engineering consultant on the water system. Uh, Chris, can you outline the report regarding the Belcarrot water system, please? Sure can. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I kind of just put a little bit of a brief update together regarding uh, my review. I finally did a review of the system that I kind of looked through, just relying on other people's reports. I actually went through and looked at the FUSP requirements and kind of ran an analysis for the village based upon the FUSP requirements. Now, as you can see, if you've read my memo, there are really kind of, there's no set way of deciding how you will set up a fire system within a municipality. It says uh, the fire chief stated earlier, it's all about a tolerance of risk for a municipality to decide on, one, if they want any fire fit, fighting capabilities, two, what level do they then want that fighting capability to be at? Now, a lot of people refer to the first guidelines because if you get to a certain level, you are then entitled to be insured, or not entitled, that's the wrong word, you should be able to get fire insurance from there. So most municipalities fire, follow them first regulation or something very close to it. Um, a lot of the times bylaws will be written so you don't have to refer back to the first guidelines each time because it, it means doing an analysis of each property or what have you. So sometimes there's just general regulations which kind of say we will require a certain amount of leaders per second. So the village has one of these bylaws and it's referred to in the subdivision uh, bylaw and development bylaw. Um, there, uh, there's a table within that bylaw that kind of states the required design flows for uh, a development. Now, obviously, this is typically for new developments, but if we just run the municipality through this scenario, you'll see, I uh, kind of summarized, that the majority of the village's uh, RS1 zoning, so you'd fall within a 60 litre per second requirement, and then the other requirement would more than likely then be the institution, which institution would be the village hall and fire hall would fall under those two categories. So, in my opinion, if you ran this analysis just through the bylaw, the lowest, the, the lowest requirement you'd really be aiming for would be 90 litres per second. Okay, and then I kind of went through another requirement of going, say, so, okay, if we run the municipality through a first guideline requirement, where does that then land? And there's a number of, there's lots of different ways you can kind of skin this cat, to be honest with you. Um, I kind of tried running two general scenarios. One was on the, both are on the village hall. Um, so the first one was regarding exactly the way that the fuss is written and I suppose interpreted is regarding the size of the building. I kind of put the general size of the building within this spreadsheet, um, kind of knocks out some, some requirements. And then a big, big component of this is step three, uh, sorry, step four regarding the exposures. And, and Jay uh, touched on that earlier today about exposures and exposures typically in the first requirement it's really regarding other properties next to the property that might be on fire. And so they talk about exposure distances to the next property from one property to the other. And so if you run the first requirement and you kind of run that analysis, it comes out with roughly 100 litres per second. So it ties pretty closely to the bylaw requirement of 90 litres per second. So it kind of gives you an idea of, hey, the bylaw is pretty close to what the first requirement would say. And I would say you'd fall within the regulations for meeting the requirement flows on that side of it. Now, to play devil's advocate, if you change the exposures to say that fires are actually, could be spread via trees, which we you know we kind of briefly touched upon earlier today with Jay, it kind of changes this exposure requirement drastically. And you see that it goes from 100 liters per second up to 167 liters per second. So that's a, dr a dramatic increase in flow requirements from FUS. So, you know, again, this is all about risk tolerance and how you want to play this scenario regarding exposures. Um, so following on from that, I kind of said, okay, if we just take the bylaw, where does that sit us with regards to the amount of water which will be required? Now, unfortunately, the municipality's bylaws don't refer to 
the actual amount of time required for a fire to be fought. So I had to refer back to the FUS requirement to say, okay, if we went on the 90 liters per second, where would that place us? And it places us in between the two highlighted sections between 1.75 hours and two hours. And now me being the engineer, I like to decrease risk. So I put it as two hours for the fire flowing requirements. So as you can see, it kind of came up with 648,000 liters. That's roughly 650 cubic meters of, of water for, store, for fighting a fire. Now that isn't storage, that is actual volume of water that you might use during a, a particular instance of two hours. And now I'll kind of jump through the next section pretty quickly. The, the Sorry, length. Chris, could you tell us what page you're on on the report? Uh, we're on page four. Thanks. Paul is just catching up. Yep. Okay. So that's the highlighted section I was just talking about between 1.75 hours and two hours of fighting fires. I know I'll kind of get through the next couple of paragraphs pretty briefly. Keep scrolling, uh, Paula. Um, this next section kind of says, more or less, the amount of storage you require is dictated on how much flow you're going to need. So um, the, the overall rate of water and then minus what's called a domestic demand, which is basically people still running there their taps, flushing their toilets, all that kind of stuff, because people in the municipality may not know that there's a fire and so therefore we'll carry on using water. So you have to include that in your calculation. And then um, finally, you have a supply rate, which you get from the district of North Van, which is 22, 21 liters per second. The short version is you're basically deficient in roughly 71 and a half liters per second if you were to fight a fire with 90 liters per second. And it's this volume or this this rate that you then need to use to determine how much storage requirement that you need. So in my kind of very generalized way of doing this, you come up with around 550 cubic meters of storage, which again, that would tie back pretty closely to Opus's report done a number of years ago. So it's a bit of a validation to say this was pretty close to what I believe should be done as well. Um, so we keep scrolling, Paula. Okay, the next bit is all about risk. And again, it isn't for me as the engineer to tell you how to run your municipality. It's very much up to the municipality to decide on what level of risk you want to use regarding fighting fires. So again, I've kind of referred back to the FUS requirement. And FUS has um, five different levels. Um, one being the absolute best, two being pretty damn good, three being adequate, and then three B is a bit of a, a gray zone. And then four and five really aren't very adequate for fighting fires and getting insurance. The, so the village is actually assessed at 3A, which allows you to have insurance coverage. Um, and I kind of, the next section highlights what 3A actually requires. So Bob, you can scroll down a little bit more. So first one is talking about firefighting supply, water supply, um, where it talks about a minimum requirement of storage, which you have. And then the other one is about the actual flow requirement, which depending which way you want to look at this, you may not have that flow fighting requirement or the storage required for it. The next one is the fire apparatus. You have all of this. Obviously, you've been a, a voluntary fire force, you have the requirements that need these. Um, let me scroll down a little bit more for me, Paula. You have the fire force, you have all of those. You have emergency uh, communications, you have that. A fire protection service area, you also have that. Now, I did make one comment. Now, this is not my area of expertise, but reading this is one thing you might want to be cognizant of and investigate a little bit further is regarding this fire hall requirement. And this is about the, the fuss actually says it has to be suitable fire hall. Now, the word there is suitable, and it's not up to me to determine if the fire hall is suitable or not. It's not my area of expertise, but it's something you might, you might want to think about because if I was looking at it, I would say suitable would have to adhere to all the, the existing guidelines and health and safety codes and work practices. So that's why I kind of just brought up that one sentence there. Um, and then my final paragraph there is just saying you do have a voluntary fire force. So, you know, you, you want to consider giving them the best tools possible wherever you can, because I kind of made a note, they don't actually get paid to put their lives on, on the line for you guys either. So that's just something else I kind of wanted to point out. Um, and then the, the, the closing here is really just the next steps of what, very high level of what you could look at going forward. One, the, the biggest question obviously is to decide if you want to go forward with a new reservoir or not. I, you know, that's 
some that was deferred to the water um, committee to carry on working on. And the next ones are just kind of like a general steps of obviously continue to apply for grant funding opportunities. You can always rack these up and, you know, what, as you get them through, it might be an idea to then proceed with construction. Obviously, next one, another big one is to actually engage an engineering consultant to go through and actually review the whole system as a whole. I don't think this has been done recently. Um, at least I don't have that information. So that's one thing to, to consider. And then the next steps then are really all about if you actually do decide to go forward with designing a reservoir, it's things like acquiring the, the crown land if required, uh, completing concepts, designs, applying for permits. Now I would point out permits can be a very lengthy process, anywhere between honestly six months to two years, depending on what re what's required and the amount of outreach required. Um, and then obviously following that, once you've got all your permits in place, you'd want to finish your detailed design, complete tenor documents, select a contractor, go ahead and construct it, and then commission the reservoir. Um, and I might just, my closing is, in my professional opinion, I think you probably should look at increasing storage capacity. But again, that's just my professional opinion is up to the municipality to decide on the risk tolerance and how they want to set up their municipality. And that, that's it, Your Worship. Thank you, Chris. Much appreciated. Um, I don't see any hands up yet, but we'll give people a second. Don Babineau, go ahead, please. Don? Don? I'm sorry. There we go. We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, Chris, thank you for your presentation. No so, so Chris, you're, you went through that report really fast. Um, you're an engineer. You know your stuff, right? I like to think so. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I um, I kind of got stalled out when you said that our capacity, if I understood correctly, we're at 21 liters per second. Is that correct? That is the supply you get from the district of North Vancouver. Okay. And, and okay, what about the residual supply that we would get from uh, the, the tank that we have up the hill and that sort of stuff? As, as, what's that calculation? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question, right? It depends on how much water you're bleeding from the reservoir. So, you know, in, in terms of if you kind of ran it at, I think it was 90 liters per second, and you wanted to run it for, I think I've got in my report briefly. Um, if you wanted to run it at the 90 liters per second, off the top of my head, I think you had something like an hour and a few minutes of, of flow yeah. work, which I think lines up closely or relatively closely to how the other fires have gone previously in the village where you had a roughly about an hour's worth of firefighting capacity. So they come along. At, at, at 90 liters per second. Yeah, well, it's hard for me to tell you what the, um, the fire force are actually using when they get to a fire. There's, there's many different ways of fighting the fire. So that would be a, a question for the fire chief. Right, okay. Now, Chris, because we were a village between forest and sea, um, we are surrounded by forest. And one of the other numbers you, you threw out there that uh, if you threw in a forest, that you should really be up to 167 liters per second. Um, did you take into consideration just uh, uh, where we're located and the amount of forest that we have uh, around our village? Yeah. And so. Why, why, are, why are we not, why, why shouldn't we have 167 liters per second as opposed to 90? You could. It, again, it, this all comes back down to a, tol a tolerance of risk. It depends on where you want to place yourself. You know, like, it, <laughs> it's a really hard question to answer because it's all about risk. There's no right or wrong answer in this scenario. It's, it's, it's very much dependent on your municipality on how you want to fight fires. Like I could refer you to Vancouver and they have the capacity to use 300 liters per second if they wanted to. You know, you guys have what you have based on the pipe sizes and the reservoir that you have and you're insured. However, being insured and having a high level of safety are two different things. I, I guess the part where I stall out though is that because we are uh, clearly a village surrounded by trees, mm -hmm. um, why would, why would your recommendation, recommendation not be uh, taking that in, into full consideration and saying that we should be at 167 liters per second given uh, what our village is surrounded by? 
hey, if, if you want me to... <laughs> put this, <laughs> but, but if, as an engineer, I'm all about decreasing risk wherever possible. And if you're saying to me, if I should select a, a liters per second, I would go and find the biggest house and the biggest square footage you have and run the first requirement through that and say, this is the amount of flow you should have. However, again, it's about tolerance of risk. You know, that, I don't know exactly how many houses you have, but uh, let's say I sell you a system for one house out of 600 and you oversized everything, but you know, it's a, it's a mega match compared to everyone else. Is that a good level of risk to run your municipality at? I would say probably not because you're probably overspending at that point in time. Again, it's about a determination for, not for me as the engineer, but really as, as, a, as a council to decide on what do you feel is a good level of risk. So, so if you take it into consideration that we have houses out here that are 8,000 to 12,000 square feet in size, and again, the fact that we're surrounded by forest, um, based on based on that, uh, uh, do you think, still think that 90 liters per second is adequate? <laughs> if you're asking for my personal opinion, I would say no, it should be higher. Well, that's 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 what I mean. I'm I'm looking I'm looking out my window right now, and all I see is 90 foot tall trees uh, over there on Turtle Head, and surrounding a uh, back of us, the same thing. It's just it's it's 100 percent forest. Um, and if we ever had a fire in a in a, a dry part of the year, we'd be in serious trouble. And so we're not like the city of Vancouver. Um, we're we're uh, at, at much higher risk, in my opinion, to what we would be uh, compared to other municipalities. So even at 90, I think we're, we're uh, 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 wolfy. Uh, I think that would, uh, that would put us in, in a precarious position. And even at that, we're 70%, 77% short of what we currently have, according to your calculations. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, I can't uh, for the life of me understand why some people don't think in this village that we don't need more reservoir space. I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, Bruce, you're up next. Thank you, Neil. And uh, yeah, Chris, thank, thank you for uh, the summary. And I, and I think you've covered virtually all the bases. Uh, the um, the, the thing that strikes me when I go through this is the fact that we actually have a 3A rating at the moment, whereas uh, I, would, I would think from running through this that we'd be fortunate to have a 3B. Do you have any comments on that? Hmm. <laughs> um, I think you might be right, Bruce. But again, yeah. I'm not the underwriter. You, no, I you've understand. You've gone through a review process already. And this is yeah. where you've been stationed at this point in time. Now, you, this, there is a likelihood or there is a scenario, sorry, I should say, that you could be audited and they say, hey, actually, we find you deficient in a number of these areas. And so therefore, yeah. we're downgrading you. We're not going to, to ensure yeah. you any further. For sure, there's definitely yeah. that possibility. Well, I, I, just, I just asked the question because in having read through uh, material that the uh, Water uh, Committee has done and material they've dug up there, there are, is some documentation that just doesn't seem to be available. It seems some of this is, uh, I assume, is a result of some face-to-face -face negotiations where uh, it seems to me we're doing very well to get a 3A rating. Now, recognizing, as uh, Chief Sharp said earlier, uh, our capability is far, far above what it was only a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, again, no, I think you've given a, a fair summary of the uh, of the challenges uh, faced. And I would suggest that, and it is something that the committee has come up with before and we haven't progressed a long way on it yet, uh, is that with these really large buildings uh, and certainly with the new ones and major retrofits, we should be putting in sprinkler systems because uh, you know, that may in fact be the best way to reduce risk with these, uh, these structures. Any of it, thank you. Yeah, so Bruce, just a comment on the sprinkler section. Uh, the first, if you if you run through the first calculation and you actually do have sprinklers, it gives you a good credit back on the flow yep. requirement for it. So that's something the first does actually interpret. But again, the problem you might face in this regard is that you might only have ten percent of your properties have sprinklers, ninety exactly. percent exactly. don't. 
and, yeah. and, and so then, you, again, you're playing with this risk game again of, well, do we want to give ourselves this credit? Because we have some we will do in the future. That's, that's kind of like the, the scenario there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah and, I, and I agree with that. And I think it's the sort of thing the Water Committee is going to, going to have to look at. I mean, ultimately, as you say, this is a risk assessment. It's dollar costs against risks, and these are big risks. So it's, yeah. uh, you want to be sure you've, uh, you've uh, uh, evaluated the risks fairly and evaluated the costs fairly, and such is life. Okay, thank you. Bruce, just to add to uh, your comment about the fire underwriter service, we are now in discussions with them. Uh, they typically yep. would like to audit municipalities every five years, mm -hmm. and their last was done in 2010. So we're in discussions with them, and a review is going to be underway. And uh, yep. your, your concerns, I think, are very legitimate. Alex Bryce, you're next. Hey, Chris, I just wanted to ask you a quick question because, <clears throat> and forgive me for not knowing all the background in terms of, you know, the, the, the water infrastructure that was put in, we're relatively new to the community, but I wanted to ask, would it be possible to use a bigger pump uh, from the District of North Vancouver to increase our flow rate in the event of an emergency? Or is the capacity of the pipe at capacity today? No, I think you have an ability to receive more water from the district, but this always comes back down to your agreement that's written right now, and I've read it a number of times, is that they are not guaranteeing you a flow rate ever. So it depends on, again, this comes down to a risk game. Again, you could you could go to the district and say, hey, we're going to run the risk and give us as much water as you possibly can. And the, then the district's having a fight in a fire. They're low drops, and you guys are down to 10 litres per second, and you have no storage left. So you don't have any flow to... You know to draw upon so it's it's just a game of risk alex again of mm -hmm. where you want to place your risk you could no doubt go maybe maybe the district will give you more water again it's not my municipality i couldn't tell you if they will or they won't um but again you don't know the scenario they might be running into the same same time as you guys so that's why i'm pretty sure they write they will not guarantee you because they might require the amount of water at the same particular time as you guys and if they wrote a legal document saying we will supply you with this, then they know they're on the hook for all the, the, the ramifications after the fact. Well, so, so just to ask a follow up question to that, because again, I don't understand the agreement between the District of North Vancouver and how that all works. But so, in your opinion, you could put more water through the pipe. It seems like a good thing to ask. And I really liked how you laid out the sort of steps in the process in terms of you know getting to that RFI that we talked about during the last council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and surely this is something that we would want to evaluate if we can put a $200,000 emergency pump in North Vancouver and save $4 million. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, I, I don't think you need a pump. You're, you, 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 don't, you don't require a pump on the district. They use, I think it just comes straight out of one of their reservoirs and uses its own head to come across and uses a siphon effect to get it up the hill. It's kind of like if you took, if you took a, a hose pipe and you had water in it, and you move the hose pipe this way, the water stays at the same elevation. And that's the same in a water system, that the certain pressure always equalizes the same. So you don't need a new pump. It's again all about the agreement with the district on whether or not they will allow you to have more water. So 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 just so I understand that the the issue is in an emergency situation, we don't have an uh, agreement in place with the District of North Vancouver, which supplies our water to offset emergency situations where there's fire applications. I mean, I get it, if the entire North Shore lit on fire, they would need their own water. Yeah. At that point, we're in a pretty catastrophic state and things are already really bad and we already have massive problems. But, but that's the particular thing that you've said, right, is that is that the water's available. We, just, we haven't we haven't got clarity from North Vancouver as to whether we can get it in that circumstance. Is that correct? Can, can yeah, I well, I, shouldn't, I, I can't speak for other municipalities. I've got to be careful there. I can't speak for other municipalities of telling you what they can and can't do. It would just be, I believe that's probably the scenario they're running through in their heads of why they've limited it to, originally I think it was, it was something like 17 and they, they've upped it over in the past uh, few years. And the, the, uh, the reason for that is, is probably because that's the residual flow they have within their system. They say, hey, we need to go, same as us, they go will say, hey, we need 120 litres per second to fight fires. And let's just say for scenario, they realized they had a capacity of 141 within their, within their system. So do you know what, uh, Belcara, we'll give you 21 litres per second because we have that residual left over in our, in our system. And that's probably how they got to the flow that they got to. 
let me add a little bit more background, Alex, so you, and everybody else in the call can uh, can catch up if they weren't earlier uh, connected. In conversations with uh, District of North Vancouver and then with Metro Vancouver's water engineering team, we were looking at all the different options. And the reason that uh, well, the reason we ended up looking early on with Metro Vancouver's support towards a, a reservoir is that it was cheaper than the District of North Vancouver's augmented supply costs. So their proposed costs were higher than a water reservoir was going to be. And it was never going to be from District of North Vancouver 60 meters per second, as everybody else has. So there was no way we were ever going to get proper fire flow from District of North Vancouver, and it was going to be more expensive. So based on us being broke and not having the options to spend the money to not only go to District of North Vancouver or directly hook to Metro Vancouver through Port Moody, we took the very least expensive option at the time, which was the water reservoir, and began planning towards that. And the grant application was filed as a result of that early, that early work. Nothing's been committed to, but you should be aware that hooking up to District of North Vancouver was more expensive than the water reservoir in the early conversations as well. All right, Rob Beg. I, I think it's important to note a couple of things. Uh, number one, the FUS was completed in 2010, and the recommendation at the time I sat with the Water Committee as they've gone through all of this information, which is a, very much a rehash. Um, and it was determined that at that time, when the FUS report was done and the 3A was given, that it was recommended immediately that upgrades take place for firefighting. So here we are 10 years later, and that did not happen. So I'm a little concerned at this point. We have sprinklers in our house, uh, not so much an issue. But if FUS is starting to look, I find it and Chris, you could probably comment to this, I think we would be very much in a position where we will be downgraded. Because you also have to understand that the requirements in 2010 and the size of the houses were totally different in Belcara. Over the last 10 years, they've changed significantly. So I think there's a double whammy coming and uh, I, was, I said I wasn't going to speak to this issue, but really, that's all I have to say at this point in time, and I think everybody should know that. Thank you. Rob? Bruce? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, just a, a clarification for the last speaker, uh, prior to Rob, the, the original uh, supply agreed to us was 14 liters a second. It's recently been upgraded to 21 liters a second. Uh, and when we look at, and, and some people have noted the volume of water we've gone through in terms of some of these uh, the firefighting scenarios, the, the reason the volumes are comparatively high is that we drew right through the potable water portion of what was in the tank. And uh, so your design on the one hand, uh, you know, such as Chris is describing, you set aside a certain amount for residential use, and then you have firefighting capacity above it. When you have a fire, you're likely to draw through both until you've, uh, you've drained the tank. Um, there was one other point I wanted to make as well. Oh, it's the uh, design. I mean, I, I don't think there's any, uh, frankly, I personally uh, would welcome FUS having a look at this, but the, the uh, uh, assumptions at that time were for a much larger Belcara ultimately than uh, what we actually look like we're going to have. If memory serves, I think it was about, you may recall, Rob, it, may, it was for 1,500 people. We're, I don't see us moving beyond seven to eight hundred uh, in the in the near future. So there's there's lots of things change over ten years, and uh, I just think it's worthy of uh, of uh, careful study before we come to a conclusion. Thank you. I think, I think that uh, the issue of people. I don't know. I wasn't here then. I don't think there's been any talk about growth, at least since I've been here to fifteen hundred. Yeah. Uh, I think the issue is that's correct. I agree with you. Uh, when they built this system, it was a bare minimum for firefighting. And I think that what everybody needs to take away, and it was designed in 2010, regardless of what the outcome will be, I think when we get to the end of this further review, we're going to agree with Chris. We're going to agree with the Water Committee, and we're going to be right back where we started. So, you know, time will tell, and it will play out. Um, I agree with Don Babineau. Uh, I think we're at risk, and I would hate to see us downgraded because a lot of people may have a problem if they have any kind of a mortgage at that point in time. The, uh, <clears throat> we, 
we'll, we'll let FUS go through the process and not worry too much about what could what could be. But uh, to say we're at risk, uh, having spoken with FUS and the fact that we had to shut down nozzles on two fires is understating the fact that you're at risk. And uh, and so yeah, there's uh, that that's very clear. Um, Don, you're next. Um, just curious now at this point. Um, I'm hearing 21 liters per second coming from North Van, um, and uh, I've heard 60 liters per second. Uh, I think that's what you ran on, Neil. Um, and I'm hearing from Chris that we should have 90, and I'm hearing from Chris's report as well that given the environment that we live in, that we should have way much more than that. Um, so based on the Water Committee's recommendation, based on Chris's recommendations, are we still sticking to the fact that what we need is 60 liters per second? Well, I'll, I'll start that answer off because you just the what I ran on. The 60 liters per second is what Metro Vancouver provides, and I was hoping for what Metro Vancouver provides. Um, in early discussions with Metro Vancouver's water engineering team, uh, we sat across the table from the CAO on about six or eight of their engineers and team, and we looked at the three different options that were on the table water reservoir, increasing flow from District North Vancouver or Metro Vancouver direct. And, uh, and then we very, they very quickly said, well, uh, if you want to hook up to Metro Vancouver, it's going to be through Port Moody and it's going to be the tens of millions of dollars. And the table was just quiet. Everybody knew there's no option whatsoever that Belcara may ever be able to afford to do that. Certainly not as the circumstances where the line ends at Metro, uh, in Port Moody. So then it became, what can we afford? Not what should we do, just what can we afford for, for, for trying to get the quickest solution possible. And then we took a look at the cost associated and it was a water reservoir that we began talking about with Metro Vancouver. The process is much further along. I'm glad that for everybody's, everybody's sake, they get a chance to have, hear from Chris directly about his, his, uh, his, his, inc his continued uh, research and examination to what, ne what needs to be done. Access to the fire department to get the, the, the facts on the diff different fires. And we probably will end up, Don, as you said, everybody recognizing who has ever seen a big fire, <laughs> recognizing that, yeah, we are at risk. And the question then is, how much risk are we willing to tolerate and what's the cost associated with that? But, mm -hmm. but don't for a second think that the water reservoir was an augmented cost. It was being looked at because it was the very least expensive option available of the three. Lisa, you're up next. Oh, wait, sorry, Chris is up. Lisa, I apologize. Chris is up. Chris, do you have a comment based on what we were just talking about? Yeah, I just want to make a clarification about this 90 litres per second. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have been so definitive in my report. Don, I think the, the answer is we need to review it. And with the Water Committee and with the municipality, you need to decide on what level you want to go with. I just use 90 because to me, that's what your bylaw currently says. Now, I think there's more analysis to be done to decide on what that flow rate is. Again, if you're asking me as the engineer, I'd be saying higher for sure because, you know, I'm all about... <laughs> Increasing risk, right? But again, that's not for me to decide. That's for you to decide. So I've just gone on ninety as a personally as a minimum. So, so Neil, I, if I could interject. Yeah. So we're we're not. It sounds like we're not set on the sixty. It sounds like we should be considering at least ninety, if not more. At what point does the village make the decision as to what we think our risk? tolerance is. I remember visiting a buddy of mine's cottage on a lake and all of the cottages on that lake, which looks very similar to our terrain, were burnt. And I could see the same scenario here. So I just, so far as us deciding as a village what our, what our objective is in terms of how many liters per second, when, when will that decision be made? Well, we're, we're, in, we're in this now. So recognize that we, we moved ahead and obviously it was too quickly to put the water reservoir in the budget. And, and it was too quickly because not everybody knew what we're talking about today. It, whether they hadn't been paying attention or they just hadn't been communicated effectively to them, they didn't know and then they, and that's, as a result, they were challenging it. So that's, the, that's the, the biggest thing is making sure that everybody is on board with the data from the, from the source as opposed to any misinformation that has been going out there. And then we can have an educated conversation and move the policy conversation forward. And, and you're absolutely right. It needs to happen. 
uh, and, and it's it's what we're going through now. Now the water committee was just brought back in, or is being bring, being brought back into the conversation, and hopefully that provides additional transparency and, and additional opportunities for communication for residents to feel uh, that their input's being considered with council. But we have to we have to consider what level of risk. Uh, that we that we are willing to accept and what the cost is associated with that level of risk and if people said we accept we, we want to have almost no risk at all we want to hook up to Metro Vancouver that is an unbelievable number that we'd have to plan for and it would be it would be, it would be a game changer for Belcara to have to put that level of, of protection in that uh, that would, would have that 60 liters coming in for Metro Vancouver direct line so, so we're gonna have to find everything else is gonna be a balance and that's this open discussion uh, that uh, that we're trying to bring everybody up to speed on to have now. This is what it's all about now. So to Rob Begg's point, we've been sitting on our hands. I won't. That that's maybe not being entirely fair, but we've been sitting on our hands for ten years. And when are we going to definitively say this village is willing to accept this level of tolerance? And at that level of tolerance, tolerance, we're going to need this many liters per second. When will we have that number? This is, this is, uh, it's a great question. I, I thought we were already there. We're back to this. The goal is to be able to have a process that's transparent. I think we're going to have to have the water committee engage with residents to the point where residents feel that the process has run its due course and they've accepted the fact that um, the, the, the residents had, had the open, open uh, forum to be able to voice their concerns and we, and we actually end up at a solution. And we may find, based on all the information you see coming out, that there's less and less um, uh, argument against adding to our water source. I mean, heck, in 2010, FUS said we had to add to our water reservoir just to maintain minimum requirements, and we didn't. And so eventually, I think we're going to see uh, anybody who is afraid of a wildfire, a fire getting out of control, is going to be something that we, we're going to have to do something about. And then we're going to make the decision on what, how much pain, how much, how much is it going to cost Belcare to be able to do it. And then we're going to have a number. And then with that number, we're going to have to decide how do we finance it. We have two choices, mm -hmm. it's parcel tax or it's road ends. So that's the, that's the decision tree that we're going to have to go down, period. It's that simple. Are we, what, you know, what are, are, we going to, are we going to accept it with the way it is? And if not, what are the options? How much do they cost? And then how are we going to pay for it? I, I appreciate all of that, Neil. Uh, but you didn't answer the real question. And that is, how much more time are we going to take to come up, get a number and agree upon that number? Now that the water committee is back involved, we're going to have to allow the water committee to get involved in the process and be part of creating that process. If it was, a, we already had this in the budget. Don't forget, Don. Uh, this, the goal was to be moving on this, and not even knowing if we were going to go with a water reservoir, there is already a grant application in. All right. And for those who aren't aware, and I was going to touch on this list later, RMP Nelly Shin presented at question period last week and did a wonderful job of pressuring the federal government to provide infrastructure spending, infrastructure grants. Uh, funds towards Belcara to help protect against wildfire and augment her water system. Mm. So she is actively in Ottawa representing us and she didn't let it go because when the when the speaker responded to her, she said, well, you didn't give me an answer. When are you going to be available for a Zoom call with the mayor? I love the fact that she was grilling that hard because she recognizes this is life and death. It's not just property. And so we've got the support for the grant funding application that's in now. So we haven't been sitting on our hands in that regard. And now we just have to have the water committee be part of the process so that everybody feels it was done properly and move it forward as quickly as we can. I know, I know it's not what you're looking for, Don, but the, the, the water committee is, is now is, is going to be involved again. And if that's what needs to be, so be it. We need to move quickly with them. Light the fire. And Neil, as far as I'm concerned, and I think that all of us should think that we've been living on borrowed time. I don't want to be dramatic, but I think we've been living on borrowed time. And I'll leave it at that. You're right. You're right, Don. Your point's well taken. Look, if it if it had been a different time of the year, or if there'd even been wind in either of those two fires on St. Clair and Turtlehead, this conversation might be happening remotely because we still haven't rebuilt Belcara. So all it would have taken is wind. Never mind dryness being a difference for things to. Be all right. Thanks, Don. Uh, Lisa, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I know Chief Jay Sharp briefly touched on it, but uh, through the chair, this is a question for Chris Boyt. Um, was the recently recommissioned Dutchman Creek tank included in uh, your report of capacity or data? Chris, you're muted. Sorry, my dog was laughing. The answer is no. I've just kind of based it on the Tatlow Reservoir. I, 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's actually currently connected up to all your hydrants. It's not. Uh, yeah, so, so I wouldn't recommend even, even considering having that uh, as a calculator. Okay, so they're not hooked up to our tanks? I mean, I mean our hydrants, right? That's right. They're not, the Dutchman Creek not, isn't hooked no, up to our, anymore. okay. Okay, Jay, thank you, you've answered my question. Yeah. All right, uh, Deborah or Peter? It, it's Peter. So we've been playing with fire for way too long. May 3rd, 2016, the Fort McMurray fire happened, 3,200 buildings down. Uh, November 2018, 19,000 buildings and 88 people dead in paradise. Those places are too far away for us to understand it could happen to us. That was North Van, Maple Ridge, Langley, Bowen Island. We'd get the message right away and we'd get with it. Everybody in Valcare would like to have 300 liters per second, but they, as long as someone else pays for it. So there's too many people here who would like to have the great system and someone else pay for it. And this plane with fire is just gone on way, way too long. Uh, we're lucky we got away with nobody dying yet or being seriously injured. And if that had happened already, we'd get more serious right away. So that's it. That's my message. Uh, Peter, Peter, you forgot to mention Squamish has already had a wildfire this year mm -hmm. and a state of emergency as a result of the wildfire. So it's not, it, it's, it's, uh, it's all around us and it's hopefully close enough for home that people recognize the threat that we are under. All right. Uh, that was a great amount of discussion. I don't see anything else uh, for hands up. Did, uh, for crying out loud, did I forget to move this one again right after Chris spoke and we jumped right into discussion? I apologize. Um, Thank you. Procedurally. Did we move yes, it? Yes, Your Worship, that's okay. Okay, so let's move the item now. Can I get someone to move it? Moved. Thank you, Bruce. Can I get a second? Hey, Rob, whatever you do, don't hesitate to use your unmute button. Okay, seconded by Rob. And uh, all in favor? Aye. None opposed? Motion carried. Chris, that's uh, a ton of work you put in to get ready for this. I really appreciate the extra time and, and uh, investigation. Thank you. No problem. On to 5.5, Ken, if you'd like to outline the next report, please. Yes, I'll just wait for it to show up on the screen. Would you like to move the motion first or do you want to have the report first, Your Worship? Uh, what do you recommend? Well, you usually like to move the motion first, but it's up to you because there are a couple alternate motions in this report. Okay, well, I'm happy to move it. So can I get someone to move it? I'll move it. Thanks, Rob. Can I get someone to second it? Second. Lisa, second. Thank you. All right. We're ready, Ken. Procedurally, we are on top. Okay. So this report is in response to the notice of motion that came forward on April 27th. There were two recommendations in that, as you can see on page one of the report. Just for clarity's sake, um, Paula, can we go to the appendices, please? I mean, the attachments. There you go. So, so just for clarity's sake, uh, this was the uh, key part of the financial plan bylaw where you can see the highlighted areas there. In 2022, uh, intangible capital assets purchased and under transfers from reserves. Provision for a $4 million fire hall uh, was included in those numbers, but in the bylaw, there was no specific identification or mention of a fire hall. So if you go on to the next attachment, uh, Paula, please. So this was the attachment that was with the report uh, that I think was referred to and this uh, specifically did mention the fire hall, as you can see under major capital projects provided for in 2022, a new fire hall at $4 million. So this scenario C is not part of the bylaw specifically, uh, but provision for a fire hall was included in the numbers to schedule A of the bylaw. So if we go back to page two then, Paul. So, okay. 
the gist of it is is that uh, in terms of withdrawing a bylaw, um, the provision for that isn't provided under legislation. You can repeal and reenact a bylaw, or you can amend a bylaw. And the simpler thing to do would be to amend the bylaw because it's a one-step process as opposed to being a two-step process of repealing and of reenacting. But the outcome would be the same uh, for either of those measures if council wanted to uh, change the bylaw, basically. So um, if you go down, uh, the, the recommendation to is we can read the recommendation maybe and then go to the alternate recommendations. So if we go up to the original recommendation, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the recommendation is that council direct staff to leave the 2020-24 financial plan bylaw, financial plan bylaw as is and to provide clarification on the purpose and intent of including the fire out capital expenditure and 2020-2024 financial plan balance through other public communication avenues and readdress the fire all issue in the upcoming 2021-25 to um, financial planning budgeting process based on obtaining updated information on the fire hall. In terms of uh, uh, move, eliminating the fire hall from the financial plan bylaw schedule, I'd uh, say that it would be awfully confusing to include a footnote on the schedule without actually having provision for a fire hall inside of the schedule. So in other words, there would be a reference to something in clarification of the fire hall without actually having the number in the bylaw. So uh, that um, would, not make as much sense. So if you move down, further down, so on a practical level to deal with the intent of the notice of motion, uh, council consider the, the recommendation or two alternative um, recommendations or options that are included in the report. If we go down further, Paul. So the alternate recommendations uh, are option A and option B. As you can see, option A is to direct staff to bring forward an amended 2020-24 financial plan bylaw that includes the fire hall capital center with the corresponding reserve funding source, same as the present bylaw, with some cross-reference wording and a footnote. And there's some suggested wording there. Or option B, uh, direct staff to bring forward an amended 2020 24 financial plan that does not include the fire hall capital expenditure and related funding. So those um, are brought forward uh, in case council does not want to go with the uh, original recommendation. Thanks, Ken. As we get this started, maybe Lisa, you can you can do a quick summary again for why you made the motion you made. And there's going to be a bunch of new people on this call that may not be aware of why you wanted to uh, to change the budget in the first place. Um, Neil, just uh, Councillor Lisa, she just, I just got a, a message. She lost her connection. Yeah. So she's trying to get back on right now. That's really bad timing. All right, so uh, we'll wait to get her back on. Uh, Alex, well, hang on. Do we have anyone from Council want to comment on uh, Ken's recommendations? All right, let's go to Alex while we wait for Lisa. Alex, go ahead, please. Sorry to talk so much, guys. Yeah, so Ken, I think the one thing that I would want, there's a couple things I want to know. I have a question and a comment. I'll start with my comment first. My comment is that uh, during our last conversation and during the last council meeting, we discussed the fact that there was significant contingency put into the budget at the $4 million level. And so um, my thought would be that it would be a good idea to reassess that number. I think that, uh, 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 the mayor uh, gave an assessment at 1.1 or 1.2 million dollars as a, as a more realistic estimate of what that cost would come in at. And the other question that I want to ask would be, um, is there going to be an uptick in revenue based on all the ticketing that's going on at the park? I know that we wrote <laughs> yesterday. 
Um, I didn't see anything in the financial projections that would indicate that there was any kind of revenue increase. Um, has that been accounted for? I think if you look at the financial plan, there has been, uh, based on the previous year, 19, 2019, actual uh, parking ticket revenue, there has been an uptick uh, in the projected amount of traffic uh, parking ticket revenue, which is a slight build on what was uh, collected in 2019. Okay. And then what about the what about the 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 estimate of the cost of the fire hall? Well, allow allow me to provide some background on this, Alex, and make sure you've got all the all the data because it wasn't anywhere between one and one point two. So, this, the uh, a couple of years ago, the fire department had uh, well, the trustees put money aside for a long time, and a couple of years ago, I think the conversation started about having the fire halls in Anmore and Belcara um, at least consideration for design. Uh, needed to be done. And so I think $60,000 was spent on designs for both Anmore and for Belcara. Belcara was presented two options. I think Anmore was three. It might have been four options. Belcara's two options were both approximately the same price, about $1.8 million. Anmore's options ranged, I think, from somewhere like two point eight to six. So the, uh, there's, two, there's a number of different, different things now you have to take into consideration with that number that we have at about one point eight. First is is that the design team that did that design, and they've done 34 other halls apparently, and they're the go-to the go-to design team, costed uh, another one of their halls and were off by half. And so that design team is not their first time they've done it, and they took into consideration, of course, where that hall was gonna be built, and they were off by half for what the fair market was. So there's a risk that worst case scenario, they could be off by half on ours, which could have made it four million. But you need to add in another degree of, of, of concern, that the current agreement with Anmore dictates that they pay for half our hall and we pay for half of their hall. And their plans for growing Anmore require a bigger hall than what you would see in the smallest recommendations made for theirs. So if their hall, for example, is four million and ours is two, even at the most basic unadjusted numbers uh, from the design team under, uh, under um, valuing the cost of building, that six million divided by two is three million now for Belcara. And we're years away from it happening. Mm -hmm. So you can expect that not only with the current system that we are now renegotiating, uh, it's going to become more expensive than the design that you were originally just alluding to as our own design. And on top of that, we're looking years in advance, which is going to cost more. And as you heard earlier today, this is the first time I think it's come up in this meeting, but the FUS may actually create some, some pressure for us based on our own lack of work safe uh, credentials within our hall, never mind the seismic failings. So that's why you see a round number of approximately 4 million. The 4 million is not funded by taxes. There is no implication to our taxes based on having that number in there. And much like other things that we didn't spend money on last year, in 2022, we don't have to put 4 million towards the hall. The intent was always to just allow us to do some planning because that's we got in this financial situation with the village because there was never any financial planning. So if we don't plan, we don't have options. And if the halls get built and the, and the village hasn't created any, any kind of nest egg, well, then we have no options. And then through Metro Vancouver, we might just be hit with a parcel tax. Bam, we had no choices because we didn't plan for it. So the, the idea of it being a footnote is, is, is uh, well, well, Ken rejected it as, uh, as making sense financially by not having a number associated within the budget. The idea is that we should begin planning so at least we have options. And now we've got Lisa back. Lisa, we lost you. I was hoping that you could provide everybody with the intent, again, uh, behind why you made the notice of motion so that people would have the context of what you were trying to accomplish. You're on mute. You're still on mute. There you go. Apologies, I lost my internet there and I just got it back up. So no I, I missed everything. I heard nothing. <laughs> I heard the last end of Alex. Um, thank you, but my rationale for that was after reading Verna Barrett's letter, and um, I, I just felt we were probably hasty in putting it on the financial plan. I, I felt uh, pressured to do that, and I'm obviously a new counselor here and not having known the whole history of the, the trustees, the SASMAP Volunteer Fire Department, what have you. And now knowing that there's a, a another there's an agreement out there, and we don't own Belcara doesn't own that property, and Belcara doesn't own that 
their halls. So there's an uh, there, absence of a new agreement. I think we are tied to use that agreement that we still have, notwithstanding that I know we need to work towards that and, and get that fixed. But absent of that right now, I don't I don't see how we can actually even place a number on it um, and, and have it included in our in our budget right now. I'm not saying it shouldn't be there and and six months or nine months down the road, we're, we're gonna be talking about this for next year already. Um, maybe that's the time to put that in there, but for to, to throw a $4 million uh, dollar figure on there um, and not even knowing what it's going to be and not even have the, and it, it we don't own it. it. We have to take our direction from the trustees from what I understand. So that's what I'm learning right now. And um, and I just can't feel comfortable having it on there. So, a quick quick reminder: if we take it out, we can't plan for it. And so, no plan means under the existing agreement, Metro Van issues what would probably be a parcel tax. That's what that's what we're doing. If we if we don't have a plan, it's a parcel tax to pay for whatever it is because we haven't been able to offset the cost. They'll carry can't assume enough debt to pay for the fire hall. So by removing it from the plan. You are saying you have to that we can't plan for it. You, you, it's, it's but we are planning for it through the, the current um, model working group that funding model working group that's going to that's that, the, the payment the payment group with the trustees is that Metro Vancouver is going to issue us a bill. It doesn't matter if we own it or not. We still have to pay for it. They're going to issue us issue us a bill, and if we can't offset that cost by having a plan then that bill's coming through as a parcel tax. But that bill is going to come through a, deci a decision from the trustees. Yes, it's correct. It's but we won't, ha we won't have options to pay for it if we don't plan. But they're not going to issue us a bill for $4 million today. And that, that figure is not part of our, our, um, our tax increase right now. It's in there for planning. That's why it's suggested just so people are more aware of it and people are freaked out when they see this four million dollars on this financial plan and and i i didn't understand i'm sorry ken i i was i'd lost the internet so i didn't hear and i did read the report though the rationale why it still couldn't be listed just as a sub note can so, you re-explain that maybe yeah um so if you remove the fire hall, $4 million from 2022, the expenditure and the funding, and you put a footnote in, it's, it can't refer to anything since the amount has been removed. And, and why can't you have a footnote that says, at an, at, well, an estimated cost yet is yet to be determined? Because it hasn't been determined. Yeah, but, but what... Um, what additional information you could do that through other public communication means right other than a formal bylaw because the schedule to the bylaw is just a bunch of numbers on, on light items right it doesn't include any narratives or anything like that but do no we have the authority i'm sorry go ahead I was going to say there's no commitment to spend four million just like we didn't spend sixty thousand on midden road last year and it was in the budget there is no commitment to spend any money, whatever that number is. It All it does by being in the budget is gives us the opportunity to plan. And if we have a plan and we start, we start working towards creating an alternative source other than a parcel tax from Metro Vancouver, we may save people a ton of money. But it's just, it's just a holder in there. We don't have to spend the money. I, you know, I'm, I just, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of... I, I don't like the fear that's always been brought out that, oh, it's going to be a parcel tax. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it just, that's just sort of a fear factor thing that gets thrown out there. And you don't know for certain that that's going to happen. We don't know that's going to happen. We don't know how much this fire hall is going to cost. There's a, a funding model working group that's working on this. This can, these figures will probably be more, uh, once there's a new agreement in place between the trustees and the, the Metro Vancouver, to replace the existing one which is being worked towards i just i just think it, it shouldn't be in there I, i'm not saying i'm not in favor of having a new fire hall. obviously i am i just don't think that figure should be in there all right uh carolina go ahead i think rob bag had his hand raised before me that uh, was he must have removed okay. it you were you were above him go ahead 
Okay, so I don't think that I don't think that stops us from planning because right now, as it is, it's uh, up on sale sale of rodents. Um, so it's not that we're gonna stop any. It, it's not that we're gonna put a stop on any um, sales of assets as of now. We don't have the plan for it. We're still raising the taxes by at least fifteen percent every year for the next few years that we're in. Um, I disagree when you say that we can't plan for it. In the meantime, while the group between Anamore and, and Belcara has their discussions, I understand Councillor Wilder's um, concerns. I, I would also, I would prefer to have that, that there in our financial plan uh, when Anamore has theirs in their financial plan and when the conversations between the two municipalities are done. Um, and in the meantime, we can still raise the tax as much as we as as we talked. We can still go ahead with selling some assets, as we said, uh, to complete other projects. But I don't think that will put a stop on us on planning. Um, and yeah, those are my comments for now. Thank you. Sure, it is worth adding. Amor has twelve million dollars in the bank, and we are, yeah. two and a half, we are we are two and a half million dollars in debt, and so they don't have to plan financially for something that they can afford. Yeah, but 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 that doesn't. Please hang on a second. Hang on. Let me finish. They don't need to plan for something that they can afford. And so we can't afford it. We can't borrow enough money to actually pay for this. We what I said, yeah. Stop, please, for a second, Carolina. We can't borrow enough money to pay for the fire hall. We, don't, we had to get a referendum just to borrow to the extent that we're already at, which is why I say using hard data, it, it, we're going to have to be able to pay for it when we can't assume that debt ourselves. How else do we pay for it? If we don't have the room, how else can we pay for it? If it's not a parcel tax, and it's not rodents, how else can we pay for it if we can't accept that much more debt because we're already so highly leveraged? If Anmore has, I, I agree, Anmore has way better reserves than we do. And if they don't have that on their financial plan, um, you know, it also uh, rings a red flag to me. Now my understanding, and I, I would like to hear from Ken on this, when it comes to safety, fire and safety for infrastructure, um, um, from something that I read in the past, it, like, could we, could we borrow money when it comes to safety of infrastructure? I don't know how else to put this. Would our borrowing room would be bigger for that? Um, well, you can always, um, you know, everyone has a liability servicing uh, limit under legislation, which is set by regulation, but you can apply to the minister to be, go above that level uh, but that would take a special permission from the minister. Which okay. is what we did to get where we are. We Have we asked for that, Ken? Uh, not to my knowledge in the past, no. No, well, so we had a referendum to, to assume the, the level of debt that we currently have. We've already had that special permission granted just to get to where we are. I understand. With the water system. Correct. Yep, yeah. I know, thank you. Neil, can I pipe in? Yeah, Rob, you're next up on hands anyways. Okay, you know, here's the problem I have, Lisa, okay? We own 50% of the shares in the Sassamat Volunteer Fire Department. It's semantics to say we don't own the building. We don't own the land. The land is used, is put out there by the province for use as a fire hall. We own 50% of the assets of the Sassamat Fire Department. I don't know and I really take exception to you putting out there that we don't own the fire hall. We own 50% of the shares. And if we're a shareholder and they're a shareholder, it seems to me that we would be classified as an owner, a co-owner, shall we say. Now, the next thing is that's really interesting is who's gonna pay for this? It doesn't matter how it's shown, whether it's a special line item from Metro Vancouver for something, uh, the ultimate people that are gonna pay for this fire hall are the villagers of Belcara. So all this does is plan to put some money aside. It's called budgeting. We do this all the time in private business, all the time doesn't mean that it's going to be spent. It's not a matter to scare anybody, but I fully agree with Neil that if we don't show that we're actually looking at trying to solve our problem, 
then Metro Vancouver can put one line on our tax bill if they so choose at that point in time. The, the actual choice will be out of your hands and the villagers. That's the problem I have with this. And I've stated this all along. And yes, it's semantics when you say we don't own the fire hall, but I guess the shares are not the fire hall. By the way, we also own 50% of all the rolling stock and all the assets. And I would expect that you would know that as a trustee. So anybody else wants to have a conversation, uh, let's go forward, but let's put the true facts out. In actual fact, we do own that fire hall and all the running stock, 50% of it. So I don't know what you got out of, in actual fact, Verna's letter, but that's exactly what she said. Okay. So maybe, uh, I'm, maybe I'm totally off base and incorrect, but that's my reading of the situation. Alex, you're up. So before I comment, I just want to obviously thank you guys for you know putting a ton of your time into making our village better. And I don't want my comments to be taken off base, but I mean, I, I just enjoyed Mother's Day with my wife celebrating through beach access for a, you know going for a kayak ride and really enjoyed that. And so obviously this is a matter that's that's close to my heart in terms of you know what we are and aren't selling off. And I think and I'd reiterate my point during the last council meeting is that this is probably not a very good time to sell anything given the current economic conditions. What I heard on this call though kind of concerned me a little bit. What what I heard was that um, you know the engineer's assessment was that um, should there be sprinkler systems in the large sized houses with significant square footage, um, it would significantly reduce our risk. That sounds like a building code issue we might want to sort of take into consideration. It, it seems like, you know, if, if folks are getting to get build super large houses, they should probably pay for the risk that they're uh, putting out to the village in doing so. Um, the second thing that I would kind of bring up is, you know, from a budgeting standpoint, when I was reading the financials, it said that 70% of the 3.7 to $4 million was from a grant. I'm not sure if that's money over top of what was put in or if the financial projections are village specific costs. And then on top of that, we would see additional 70% grant funding to, to pay for infrastructure. And you know, just farmer math. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm no accountant, but that would put us at $10 million, which opens up a ton of options. I, I think that my concern is advocacy. I think that, you know, if North Vancouver has the water capacity to give us the water, again, I'm not at the table. I don't know what those conversations look like, um, you know, but, but, but I, I would hope the council is pleading to see if we can sort of leverage uh, some sort of flexibility or look at some sort of different options. Um, you know, building infrastructure is obviously super expensive. I get that no one wants to share, but we're looking at the worst case situation where we would have, you know, a, a, a catastrophic event. Um, and my hope would be that, you know, we're doing our due diligence to make sure that, that we're doing that. And, uh, you know, another comment would be the $4 million budget number that we discussed during the last council meeting was based on Bowen Island, which is a massive fire hall with a command center with police infrastructure and not even remotely comparable to what we're looking at here, I would hope. Um, maybe there's an opportunity to sell off City Hall and put it into the fire hall. I'm not 100% sure what it would look like, but, um, you know, I, th I think that we need to be, no one's questioning the importance of investing in our firefighting resources, uh, and no one's questioning the sacrifice that our volunteer firefighters are making when they go out and fight these fires. I just think that the financial projections that we're seeing are, in some cases, nonsensical they just, they just don't make sense and i think that that's why all these questions are coming up so frequently and and i would hope that we can just do a deep dive as a community into this and look at all of our options alex i'll, I'll offer a little bit uh because you're off on a couple of your calculations the third the 73 percent is out of the 3.8 million it's not on top of it so the village would only be responsible for approximately 26.7 percent of that 3.8 million if the water reservoir was the way we went and if we had required that much spent so that was just the entirety of the grant application. The, uh, the Bowen Island is, uh, was costed at 4 million, just like Belcara's Hell was costed at approximately 1.8. The actual market value came back at eight for actual build in Bowen Island. We don't want anything like Bowen Island. What we're showing when we take a look at a, a number we have to pick for the purposes of budgeting, because budgeting requires having a number there. We're picking a number that was based on 
a hybrid between if they were off by 100% of the cost in Bowen Island to build, the, to build it, maybe they're off on 100% of the cost for Belcara. Plus, we're going to have to pay for half of Anmore's bigger hall as well. So if we're going to, if we're going to take a look at a, a, a worst case scenario, it would be much higher than $4 million. But $4 million as a placeholder for something we can at least begin planning towards is how we got those numbers. I hope that helps. Uh, any other people, conversations? All right, that's it. So uh, we have to decide if we're going to move A, B, or C, correct, Lorna? Uh, Your Worship, you have already have motion on the floor, and that is the motion Ken put forward at the beginning of his report. Well, for Ken's recommendation is the motion we've already yes. put forward. So that's what we'll have to vote on first. Correct. All right. So all in favor of Ken's recommendation, please. Everybody remember what it is? Nobody in favor of Ken's recommendation? I had lost. Shall I, shall I read the recommendation so everybody remembers this? That council That's a good direct, idea. That council directs staff to leave the 2020 to 2024 financial plan bylaw as is and to provide clarification on the purpose and intent of including the fire hall capital expenditure in the 2020 to 2024 financial plan bylaw through other pu public communication avenues and readdress the fire hall issue in the upcoming 2021 to 2025 financial planning budgeting process based on, upda on obtaining updated information on the fire hall. Okay, so let's vote for this one first. All in favor. All right, I would have been the only one in favor for that. So I'm gonna vote for this and we got and four opposed. So then, Lorna, we want to move to option A next. Are we going to vote? Do we want to move option A or option B? Well, we should ask council if they, anyone wishes to move option A or B, Your Worship. All right. You heard, the, you heard the boss. Does anybody want to move option A or B? I would like to move option B, please. You want to remove the fire hall from the plan? For now. That's not so, like I said, until the group finished their conversation and until we have perhaps more quotes. But yeah, you I would like to move, amend it? Would like amend to move it? option B, please, which is amended, right? No, no. You, you, do you want to amend it to include what you just said? Amend? No. I, 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 you asked me to move A or B. I'm moving B. All right. So forget all the until stuff. So option B, is there a seconder for option B? Lisa seconding. Second. Should we read option B? Because this is a yeah, bit. I'll read it. Direct okay. staff to bring forward an amended 2020 to 2024 financial plan bylaw that does not include the fire hall capital expenditure and related funding. So it removes the fire hall from the plan. So Lisa okay. seconded it. All in favor? Aye. All any opposed? All right, it fails. So, uh, does anybody want to move option A or do we just move on? Bruce, I can't hear you. Sorry, Neil. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the point, I, I would be happier with option B, but I want to specify once we have financial estimates from the, the SASMET Volunteer Fire Department, that we at that point recognize it. It's really what uh, I think uh, Carolina was referring to early on in her discussion. I think we should recognize that there is an expenditure that we can anticipate realistically. It's, it speaks to your point on planning, but I don't believe the number belongs in here for the reasons that were specified earlier in some of the, some of the letters we got. It's an SVFD expenditure. I take Rob's point that uh, we, we, we were very likely end up owning and paying for one half of the capital there as we have for many years. Uh, but we don't have hard numbers yet, and it's really up to the trustees to make that decision. So, so you, you'd rather move it me, completely, or would you rather just pick a much lower number so you can still plan? No, we can plan even without having the number in there. I would, I would specify in the option B that, uh, that uh, recognition of the cost uh, anticipated from SVFD uh, be included as soon as we have a decision from the uh, trustees. So Lorna, what's the process for this motion to be put on the table? Um, didn't Councillor Drake, you just voted in opposition for 
Yes. For B as it is, yeah, I want to see it amended. So I guess I'm proposing a, an option C here. It's really yes, just because a, it's you an can, amended. If it's you an vote amended. Against, yeah, sorry. Sorry. If you vote against a motion, you can't bring it back. I'll bring if it I, back. If I bring new words to it. It's, is it a new motion? Um, yes, it's a new motion. What if we call it's it a, it's a new motion. motion? What if we call it a new motion? Uh, okay. Could we call the vote again, according to Robert's rules? Could we do that? No, we can't. No, no it's already been decided. Okay. Option C. So, I offered you the option to amend based on what you were describing with Bruce's, and you chose not to, look, Carolina. Yeah, I should have gone for it, sorry. So Bruce, I just think it. I just think it helps to clarify this. I mean, a note about that anticipated expense should be in here. Somebody who reads it should register. We anticipate an expense, but I don't think we have the numbers yet. And it's really up to the, as has been pointed out to us, it's up to the SVFD trustees. So could I move this move this motion, Lorna, as option C, and do another vote? No. <laughs> so what are our options here? Well, I think, um, Ken, do you want to explain your option A? Perhaps that's what they're looking for. Um, my understanding is uh, that council is leaning toward an am amended option B with a slight clarification uh, as uh, outlined by Councillor Drake. Um, okay. So, but uh, Councillor Drake can't bring it back because he voted position but so I, perhaps if we get wording and then um counselor uh, clark could decide if she wants to move it or counselor wilder i think that would work okay looks for me do we run a risk of automatically having to take the number that the svfd comes up with because the trustees are currently have been currently presented two drawings with full costing there's no other options on the table right now. And so under the current under the current plans that we have in front of us, if we were to accept something and if we stick with the existing deal with Anmar and they do it, they build a six million dollar hall, we're automatically putting into our budget a four million dollar hit that you're trying to avoid anyways. I don't know if we should automatically have that in there just as a consideration. Yeah, that's a good point. If you if Neil, if you want to go on, I'll work, I'll try to work on an amendment here and sure. then we can come back to it because I appreciate your point is a good one. I think, I think we want to be careful in the wording, but I also think someone reading the plan should get an indication that there is an expense anticipated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, and we may be forced sooner than later if FUS requires it as well. So it might be out of our hands. Mm -hmm. Understood. All right, so Lorna, can we move on without with, and then look to return when uh, when Bruce has the wording confirmed for his option C? That's fine. Yes. All right. Uh, then we are on to six point oh uh, reports from mayor and council committee representatives. I'll start. I was going to mention the part about Nellie, and I want to continue to uh, to let everybody know how great she has been in supporting us. Uh, in trying to secure the grant funding for any any improvements for our firefighting capacity for water flow. So you guys, um, I don't think Nellie gets the credit for the amount of work she's doing uh, because we, we don't see her all the time, but behind the scenes, she has been absolutely fantastic. Second thing is, um, just as a quick heads up, we, uh, we as in Belcara from Friday to Sunday issued 99 parking tickets. Uh, it appears that the RCMP didn't do any and uh, Coquitlam Towing towed three vehicles. So Metro Vancouver thinks the May long weekend is the one that's going to really hit us. So that was that ain't nothing that yet, as the, uh, they used to say in the old black and white movies. But as a heads up that um, our bylaw officer is doing a fantastic job. Uh, as you can imagine, it's not easy to go and write 99 tickets uh, in three days when you're when you're having to actually interact with people while you're writing the tickets. Uh, that's it for my update. Carolina, do you want to do your own update or is it a question for me? Uh, no, it's actually a thought. Um, I would like uh, if we could perhaps contact Parks and ask them to leave those three beautiful shiny signs uh, until the end of the summer. Is that something we could do? Already done. I don't know if they plan on taking it out 
Already done. Wait, okay. Already done. Okay, so are they gonna keep it? Yes. Great, thank you. Deborah Struck or Peter. There. Um, yes, my question with regards to the flashing signs, and I thought we had suggested instead of saying like where it says no park parking um, here, but no park or hiking because so many people, I cannot believe how much traffic we had and how many near accidents I saw to do with the number of people and doing U-turns and stopping in the road and waiting and waiting and waiting for people to leave and move. And it's so dangerous. It's a good thing that Shay was writing those tickets. Um, but I think we also need to be more diligent in those flashing signs because I think a lot of people are going, well, I'm not going to the park. I'm going to Jug Island. So it doesn't affect me. So. Yeah, just yeah, a it's, a, it's a good point. We do allow parking for Jug Island. So, That's right. uh, so they're, they're right. They have the right to come in and, and do that. Lions Bay shut down uh, their beaches and put up signs at the entryway saying, I think local traffic only or, or maybe no parking only. And I think there's a sign in Anmore that says no street parking. Is that correct? Uh, by, the, by the fire hall. We could become, we, we could put a policy forward that would tighten or the restrictions around people being able to park as the COVID uh, restrictions ease. Um, and that would have to indicate a, a change of sentiment because um, the, 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 the majority of feedback previously was that Belcare wasn't supposed to be a gated community. And so we need to be feedback from residents that they would like to see that level of, um, of blocking people coming to use Belcare's parking to access those trails. And, and I've been talking with another residents, not that I'm trying to find them, it's out on the street and they're complaining, um, but it's specifically around the whole, because they had gone to the first one and they said, no, they think resident only parking, especially now that they see all these problems. But I don't know, does somebody have um, exactly what was the agreement with Metro Van to do with Block 48 and do the new people such as Alex, and then realize that we gave up some land to the park to get the park traffic off our road. I also found a document from the late 70s that even then they were saying there should be no park traffic on our roads. That was, yeah, a long yeah. time ago. The, uh, the question's good about sentiment and if it's gonna to continue to shift, I think the more people are negatively impacted by by all the traffic and the concerns around safety and the parking issues the more people can choose to um guide council to to change to change things the way they are and your worship i would like to remind council too that we did have a public information meeting scheduled for all the residents in april and it had to be postponed because of the COVID situation so we certainly would be having that meeting um, when the COVID pandemic is lifted. Yeah, great point. And, uh, and they're, uh, they're, in the meantime, there's still the opportunity to write into staff and have your letters be included as, uh, as information items also as per the agenda. Correct. And, uh, and we can take feedback for staff in the meantime that way as well. Anything else for reports from council? Well, there is one, your worship from Councillor Drake, a verbal report regarding the uh, water system committee. All right, uh, Bruce, are you ready for that? Or are you? Uh, yeah, I'm about halfway through permutations here on the mo motion, but I'll just say very, very briefly, I wanted to thank the, uh, uh, the water committee uh, members for being willing to do some additional work. I'd like to encourage anyone who has uh, questions or suggestions to take advantage of the opportunity to participate in those meetings. These will probably be quite detailed, uh, but the end of the objective here is the same as the objective has been expressed by several people in the in the meeting tonight and uh, it has to do with ensuring uh, safety within the community and uh, I think Neil summarized it nicely as a, as a uh, uh, an issue of thoroughness for those who still have questions or concerns we are making our way through it I appreciate for many people this can be a frustrating process but these things do take time and forming a consensus as to what level of of uh, service and capacity this village is seeking is something that simply does take time and engagement. And I think it's evident by the participation tonight. Uh, I think that was all I wanted. I did want to ask as well, 
uh, Rob and I have had an exchange. Uh, Rob had served as the uh, coordinator for the village to the water committee. Uh, my understanding is he would prefer not to do that in the immediate future. I'd indicated I was willing to do it. I just wanted to formally deal with that here if the council does want me to take that role on. Uh, Rob, Rob, uh, Rob has indicated yes. He does not want to. He does not want to um, play the role as as you yeah. revive. Have you as you revive the water committee with it with the new yeah. uh, terms of reference? Rob had offered and, right. and, and volunteered to give it to you. So, Rob, anything you want to add? You're you're muted, Rob. Rob, you're muted. I felt the water committee did a great job, and uh, I thought we were at a point with all of this that we were moving forward and we're not. And seeing how I've opposed uh, both items, I don't believe that I would do a good job on uh, continuing on with either that or, or the fire hall, which I believe has been turned over to uh, Lisa Wilder. Okay, I just, yeah, I just, just wanna say thank you, Rob, for the work you've done on both and uh, uh, appreciate that uh, none of these none of these processes are uh, are easy ones, and I think everybody who volunteers, including uh, counselors who put in the time uh, to try to advance these, uh, uh, should be our appreciation should be expressed. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Right. Uh, I am in case. I, I, the, so we will ensure that people are aware once the opportunity is there to. to uh, to uh, sit in and, and uh, participate in meetings of that committee uh, will ensure there's communication to everyone and that there's a posting on our, on our website as well. Uh, if I can, Neil, I'd like to go back to the effort to come up with an option C. Just before you move back to that, don't forget as you set up the plans for the water committee that we'd like to have an associated budget for it. And so uh, we're- Oh, we're, yeah. We, we yeah, I should have spoken to that. My apologies. Thanks for raising it. Yeah, I don't see the committee because they're all volunteers. I don't see them requiring a budget. What they will do is they may make a recommendation. I see the recommendation. And I used an example, I think, in one of my earlier emails of, of, of something that was observed uh, formally, which is the lack of documentation on our SCADA system. Obviously, accurate information about our water usage, particularly during fires is is a critical input to uh, the discussions and considerations we're having now. Uh, they had made a recommendation previously that we needed to address the lack of documentation and the lack of a manual for a SCADA system. And that sort of thing will obviously incur costs and will incur uh, and will commit staff time. But I see that type of recommendation, Neil, coming back to council to decide. You may say, we may say yes, and spend the necessary time and resources, or we may say no, but I don't see that as a budget item that we should tag to the uh, to the water committee. We uh, we could budget something for the water committee so that Chris, if he's asked questions by the water committee, is yeah. already pre, is already pre-approved to answer them. So if the water committee is going to ask our water engineer any questions, if yeah. we don't if we don't have a budget, we're not we're just not doing proper accounting principles. We can put oh, we okay. Can, we can put money well, aside because I see the expense going to be with the water engineering firm. Um, yep. man managing communications rather than something directly for the water committee. Well, okay, I can, I just, I'll give I you a budget, there. but that it, it's going to be like about twelve hundred dollars, say four hundred dollars a meeting times three meetings. I mean, but I'll give you one if you would prefer to have that. Everything's got to be budgeted, and uh, yeah. we're happy to spend it as part of what this is. What this is what people would like to see. We're happy to spend it. Just want it to be budgeted. Yeah. Yeah, no, fine. I'll give you I'll give you a, a very bare bones uh, proposal because I don't see any other expenditures that are likely to. Uh, to in to well, I don't see any way by which they could incur other expenses. They'll be making recommendations to us to do things as a council. Okay, then uh, let me come back to the, my proposal around that, uh, if I might. Option C. You bet. Yeah. So, the wording I would propose is what you, we have under option B. So, direct staff to bring forward an amended 20 to 24 financial plan bylaw that does not include the fire hall capital expenditure and related funding. New sentence, while recognizing that SBFD trustees are considering the potential need to make major investments in its fire halls. Such investments will require Belcaro residents 
to pay. Now we want to stay away from the question of share. That's why I was uh, what I was working on as we got to that very point. And for those who are on the call who are curious, there's there's an issue as to whether or not uh, how those costs would be shared between the two municipalities. Uh, and that's one of the points of discussion with uh, some representatives from Anmore uh, at the moment. So, um, well, maybe I just finished such investments will require Balcara residents to pay a portion, period. I recognize that's rather awkward wording, but the point is just a flag that there is an expenditure anticipated. We don't know when it will occur precisely. We don't know the precise costs, but it's significant. Thus, my uh, I use the term major investment. Councillor Drake, I believe we have it for the most part, but would you mind sending it to us tomorrow? Exactly. Yeah, I certainly will. I Thank might you. even find more something more elegant than pay a portion for the last uh, three okay. sentences. But it will have exactly that uh, tenor to it. Okay. So then we're asking if either Councillor uh, Clark or Wilder would like to move that motion. Councillor Wilder has her hand up. Okay, guys, let's get rid of the mutes so we can. All right. Move. All right, so moved by. Councillor Wilder. All right. Seconded Second by Councillor Clark. Clark. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And motion passes. Did so you ask if anyone was opposed to worship? I'm sorry? Opposed. Was it? Yeah. Two opposed. Thank you. Two, two opposed. Oh, so, two opposed. Thank two you. Opposed. Yeah. Okay. So it passes. And Bruce, you can send in the uh, the, the wording that you find is, is as elegant as uh, you can come up with the next one. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, right. Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. All right. So now we are up to number seven. So on the bylaws, there are two bylaws up for adoption. The first is the 2020 annual tax rates bylaw. Can I get someone to move it? So move. Sorry, who seconded it? Yeah, Clark. Councillor Clark seconded it. Any discussion? None seen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Aye. Motion carried. The next bylaw is the Alternative Municipal Tax Collection Scheme bylaw. Can someone move this item? So move, Clark. Second. Second. Second by Wilder. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Motion carried. Look at that. We could have done all four readings, Lorna, with both of those, and we shouldn't have done all four with the uh, with the budget. <laughs> That's good. We'll send the um, tax notice out to the printers tomorrow, Your Worship. Sounds good. All right. There are seven pieces of correspondence. Can I get someone to move receipt of the items, please? Clark moves. Clark moves. Second. I'll second, second that. Wilder seconds it. All in favor? Uh, discussion. Aye. 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 We're going to we get into discussion. Into we're going to get into the information items that says after we uh, motions carry. We can address any of them. We can discuss it first if you guys want. We're going to discuss them anyways. Okay. I believe it was past your worship. Yeah. Was it all? Okay. All right. Motion carried. Motion carried. And go ahead. Anything rising out of the information items council would like to discuss? Um, you want to put me. your hand up? Okay. I think that's uh, going to be Councillor Clark. Yeah. Okay. You're up. You call Carolyn. <laughs> um, Yes, I would just like to point it out to Kim Alfred's letter and just make a comment. Um, there are more options out there for us to be able to fight fires for longer. I'm happy that the committee's back at work on this. Um, so, you know, uh, hopefully they'll read this letter and, and see some of other ideas from other residents as well. So that's my comment for now. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Any other council members have new business to discuss? All right, public question period. Anyone from the gallery, comments, questions? Dave Goodman, you're first. Thank you. Um, so just observing the, the way these meetings go, uh, I. I appreciate that on each motion before councillors are asked to vote, you do ask for comments from 
uh, the residents, and I think that's a great idea. But I think things would go smoother if you as the mayor, uh, on any motion, just considered yourself as another uh, counselor in the sense that um, people can speak to the motion. Normally, a person would speak, then the next person would speak, etc. And so rather than commenting on every counselor's um, <coughs> position, that you then took your place in turn to make the points that you wanted to make. Okay, noted, thanks. There's nothing else. Bueller, Bueller. Like everybody's getting tired, it's getting late. All right, is there nothing else before we move to adjourn? Oh, oh we just got one up. Deborah or Peter, please go ahead. There's on mute. Uh, just to Dave's comment, I just wanna say Considering how the council meetings used to go, where you had to wait till the very end, and obviously previously too, that it was every comment was kind of guided by a particular person during the meeting, and we all had to wait till the very end to maybe get to ask questions. I so appreciate the way that it is now, and I so I'm I'm tickled to see so many people here. I wish more people would speak up. Thank you, Alex, for speaking up because you have some good comments, and um, I think it's very good. Thank you for council and Mayor Belenke for having council meetings be this way. Thank you. Noted. Any other comments? All right, everybody. I think we should, uh, seeing nothing else, move to adjourn. Can I get anyone to make the motion? No move. Councilor Fowler. Seconded by Councilor Baig. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Motion carried. All right, that was a long one. We got through it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to staff for all the work you guys do in putting this together to the end. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. And thanks, J Sharp, for participating. Yeah. yeah. Good night. Absolutely. Good night. Good night.